Are we ready? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday, January 22nd meeting of the uh, Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Would the clerk help me with the roll call, please? All right. Chairman Harley. I am here. Rich Roberts. Here. I am here. Uh, Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Oikel. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. Mr. Homicki. Here. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Silver. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Ms. Antoniak. Yes. And Ms. Murphy. Not here. All right, so if my math is correct, we have 11 parties here. Only nine will be voting at any given time, but all 11 can participate in the, the proceedings. Um, let's see, the alternates are Dave and Yolanda. Mm -hmm. You know, you're participating but not voting, right? Yep. All righty. Yes. So with that, would you call the first item? Item 3.1, we've got application 2029-19Z, uh, Z Phoenix, uh, 1210 LLC seeking a special permit for two medical offices buildings totaling 80,000 square feet uh, and an employee daycare center at 1210 Celestine Highway. All right. So while the applicant joins us at the microphone, uh, I'm just going to make an announcement. The third, there are three items on the agenda tonight, and the third one is a, is a dog park, and the other two are actually pretty meaty. Um, applications so I guess I want to warn you that please stay but um, it's going to be late before we even get to it uh, and if it does strike 11 o'clock we may not get to it so I just want to kind of give you a heads up <coughs> I don't even think the applicant is here because they knew that they had two in front of them so um, you know I just want to offer you an opportunity to come back a little later but it's up to you already so with that Please introduce yourself and your project. Thanks. I was a little nervous. I thought they were all here for my project. <laughs> I get very nervous. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike Panic. I'm the president of Phoenix Realty Management and the owner of the property at 1210 Silestine Highway, the former Puritan Furniture Building. Um, we also own and have redeveloped on Silestine Highway for a little bit background, uh, 860 Silestine Highway, which is a small building next door to the Burger King. Uh, we built 17 years ago the buildings at 1190 and 1206 Silestine Highway, which is the Liberty Bank uh, property, uh, which is in front of 1210. Uh, we also are the owner of 1260 Silestine Highway, known as the Hartford Hospital Building, which has been through two renovations since we've owned it. Uh, both uh, I came here to the PNZ. So I'm no stranger to the town or to the various commissions, including the planning and zoning, and I thank you for listening to our um, information tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, here with me tonight in the audi uh, audience uh, for uh, my team for the project. Uh, we have our site engineer, Close Jensen and Miller, represented by Kevin Johnson and Corey Garrow. Uh, we have our traffic specialist from Fuss and O'Neill, Mark Vertucci. I have my architect from Shadler Selenu Associates, Charlie Nyberg. And I have my general contractor from Stefano Construction, Joe Stefano. Uh, and to give you more information on the project, I'd like to start with my team with Kevin Johnson from Close Jensen and Miller. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Kevin Johnson, Close Jensen and Miller. Um, just one housekeeping uh, issue. Uh, I did uh, provide to Mr. Gillespie the certificates of mailing. I'm going to do something a little different than usual. Um, it's a little easier. Um, so just a quick site orientation with the site plan. Uh, this is our existing survey plan. Uh, 1260 uh, medical building, 1190 Silestine Highway is to the top. Uh, Mill Street, Mill Point Condominiums to the right. Uh, the railroad to the bottom. Uh, floodplain I-91 uh, is to the left. Uh, the site is located, I, I'm sure you all know where it is, the former Puritan site. Um, it's located in the RC uh, Regional Commercial Zone. Uh, it's about 12 and a half acres. Uh, some of the site features, um, the site is predominantly floodplain. Um, 
that floodplain line is indicated by that heavy black dashed line. Uh, so this is all floodplain. Uh, we do have wetlands that were flagged by a soil scientist uh, in 2019. Uh, we have wetlands along uh, the west, the south. There, there is an additional parcel of existing, uh, which does not have any development on it, um, but there are wetlands to the south and partially along the east. Um, we do have along the easterly uh, property line a 50-foot Eversource right-of-way. That's right along here. That's indicated by that light dashed line. We also have, um, this is a separate parcel. It's not encumbered on our parcel, but it is uh, immediately to the west of us. Um, and it does have importance, which I will get to in a few minutes. Um, an additional 100 foot uh, ever source uh, right away. Uh, generally, for topography, um, there's about a 10 uh, foot drop uh, from east to west. Uh, storm drainage generally follows those same patterns, uh, sheet flows uh, to the west. Uh, we have Gough Brook. Uh, which is flowing from northwest to generally southeast, and there's a floodway which is associated with uh, Gough Brook. There's two access points. Um, there's what we commonly refer to as the Puritan site drive, uh, originating from Silestine Highway, and we also have uh, very limited access frontage on Mill Street. Uh, but again, there's two points of access. Uh, there are existing utility systems uh, that provide utilities to this site, obviously to the former Puritan building. Um, <clears throat> they originate both in Mill Street and in that Puritan Drive. Uh, site sanitary flows from the site uh, through a wide array to uh, Middletown Avenue. Uh, and just for reference, uh, we did receive <coughs> Inland Wetlands approval uh, in October of 2019 and design review uh, in November 2019. We do have to go back to uh, design review uh, for final uh, approval of architectural treatments. So in terms of the site plan, um, we're proposing two uh, medical office buildings, each building 40,000 square feet. They're indicated uh, with a dark brown. Uh, the larger of the two is a one-story uh, building. The smaller of the two is a two-story building. Uh, and based on the grading of the site, the smaller building has a basement level, and we're proposing parking uh, underneath the actual office space. Um, again, I mentioned the two access points, uh, the Puritan Drive, uh, and, and Mill Street. Uh, basically what we did was we connected those two access points with a main drive 30 foot wide through the center of the street. Um, now I did mention that 100 foot uh, Eversource right of way. Uh, when we initially uh, commenced design work, uh, we were proposing to take that drive across a portion of that Eversource right of way. Um, and form an intersection with Mill Street. Uh, the applicant had a discussion with Eversource. Uh, they did not approve of that arrangement. Um, they were not going to grant us an easement. Um, there is an existing easement in place, and it's been in place for a number of decades. Um, the dental lab, uh, 36 Mill Street, is immediately adjacent to this parcel. And Obviously, decades ago, someone realized that there may want to be a drive to Mill Street. Um, so there is a triangular easement. Uh, the applicant did talk to the owner of this adjacent parcel. Uh, they are on board uh, with us configuring a driveway across a portion of their property. There will be a loss of eight or nine parking spaces. Um, the applicant has had discussions with the owner of that property. Uh, we will configure a parking plan, add parking to the rear, 
uh, I believe there may also have been, and, and the applicant can correct me, um, some discussion about some repavement of that parking lot as well to accommodate that parking. Uh, so again, that Eversource right-of-way to a large degree dictated the configuration of at least this end of the site drive. Kevin, where, where you're pointing to, is that off-site? Right no, here? keep going south. South, right? This Down, is on. Now, off-site, <coughs> now back. You point, oh, okay. You're pointing, <coughs> this is parking our, would go where? Right to the rear, this is the dental lab property. That's a, who? The dental lab. Oh, is that gone? Oh. That's the dental lab. And that's, that's not wet? Well, they ha there is existing pavement. Oh, okay. Okay, I got you. That's part of their paved lot? Okay. Yeah. Applicant has a much better graphic than I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of paved. So this, this is the triangular <laughs> easement right. area. The red indicates the proposed road. And you can see the number of cars here that will be displaced. We're going to recreate some parking back here, and you can see there's already existing pavement. Who's going to pave that? The applicant. Hmm? The, the applicant. The applicant. I, because it's in not in good shape. Yeah, this is the dental lab here. Yeah. Uh, and then this dotted <coughs> triangle here represents the easement uh, that's on the uh, town's records. And I talked to the owner of the property. The owner is not actually the dental lab. The dental lab rents from the owner. The owner is in Florida. He and I have had several conversations because of the work that we're doing here in close proximity with his. And back here, when well, first of all, let me say that the dental lab doesn't have any day-to-day, -day, sorry, doesn't have any day-to-day -day foot traffic. These are all employee cars. They come and they stay all day. So under normal circumstances, this could be considered like prime parking if people were coming every day to go to the dental lab. But since it's not, he said it's not a problem. We're going to pave this area back here, and the black line goes a little farther where the thing. But this whole area back here can be paved. It's currently paved, but as you said, in terrible condition. But we made an agreement that we'll pave this so that his six to eight cars that normally park here can just park over here. And then we, you know, we have a, a, an extensive landscaping plan to make it look nice between his property and the driveway here. And that's all in place. And as far as who's going to pay for it, we are. We're also, while we're here, there's going to be, there was an old rickety fence here that we took down, and we're going to clean that whole area up as well. We already took the fence down for him. That was on his property. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so again, with that main... Uh, drive through the center of the site. In essence, what we did was to create parking off of that main drive. Um, so we basically have four general areas of parking. Uh, setbacks, uh, we're, we're in conformance to the setbacks, coverages. Uh, the only item as far as zoning that we're not in compliance is the street frontage. Uh, I believe it's a 100 foot frontage that's required. Uh, we have I think it's about 17 feet, um, but that's not something that we can can change. Um, the, the easement gives you what? Excuse me. The the easement gives you what? Uh, 50 feet. Thank you. So again, as I say, someone had some fourth site many decades <coughs> ago. Uh, for 80,000 square feet of medical, uh, we need 480 parking spaces. Uh, we're proposing 610, and, and you'll hear additional information on parking uh, shortly. And, and that includes the, the parking underneath the second phase structure? Co correct. Thank you. It, as well as 40 handicap spaces, which is well in excess of what the minimum requirement is. Uh, each of the two buildings has a port cochere and a drop-off area. Uh, again, you'll hear additional information on architecture uh, a little later by our architect. Um, in terms of sidewalks uh, and connectivity to existing sidewalk systems, uh, there is a, a sidewalk system on the south side of Mill Street. 
It does end just about where our uh, proposed driveway intersection will be. And there's an existing sidewalk along the existing Puritan Drive, which ends uh, about with driveway to 1190, the bank parking area, uh, terminates. Uh, we're proposing to add an additional uh, concrete sidewalk, uh, which crosses uh, Goff Brook, as well as a new concrete sidewalk from Mill Street, and then along and through the center of the site. Again, I mentioned we have a 30-foot drive. We're going to stripe a five-foot width and uh, connect the two sidewalk segments, so there'll be continuous uh, pedestrian access through the site. The phase one building, the one-story building, there is a daycare proposed uh, to service that building. This is not a daycare that's going to be open to the public. Uh, it's going to be solely for uh, the employees of that building. I believe the entrance to that daycare is through the rear, and, and again, you'll hear more of that from uh, our architect. Um, I do have one waiver request tonight, and that's for loading. Uh, we're not proposing any loading for this site. Um, the applicant does not feel, based on the use of these two buildings, that loading is going to be uh, required. So we are asking for a waiver from that requirement. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, site landscaping, uh, we developed a comprehensive landscape plan for the entire site. Um, basically, it consists of deciduous trees, ornamental trees, broadleaf evergreens, perennials, uh, ornamental grasses, and, and such. Um, I'll just kind of go around the site. Um, again, from the Mill Street, we've created a, uh, a landscape uh, entrance with deciduous trees, uh, some vestigiate conifers. Um, I am proposing on the plans that they be maintained at about a 20-foot height. Um, some ornamental trees uh, along the right-of-way. Uh, again, you'll notice some of the configuration uh, of the ma uh, major deciduous trees are such. Uh, we did that purposely so that there could be access to uh, provide snow storage in some of these landscaped areas. And we've also provided a large uh, grassed area here for uh, snow storage. Um, along the main drive coming through the center of the site, uh, we're proposing major deciduous trees. They'll mature at about 40, 45 feet. Uh, within the smaller uh, parking areas and those islands, we're proposing uh, smaller uh, ornamental trees, flowering plums. They'll mature at about 20 feet. Uh, along the easterly property line, again, I mentioned that uh, easement, Eversource easement. I'm sure you're all familiar with Eversource requirements, uh, very stringent on plant materials, types of materials that can be planted, the heights. Um, I, I'm not proposing any conifers there. Um, I know it would never be approved by uh, Eversource. What I am providing, um, proposing is uh, flowering plums, flowering dogwoods, uh, plants that will stay We'll probably have to maintain them at around 15 feet or so, um, but that's along the east. What about the winter time? There won't be any conifers. They'll, they'll just have the tree structure. Uh, continuing around the south side, uh, again, I mentioned we received uh, wetlands approval in October. Uh, we do have a wetland mitigation area uh, on the south side of the site. Uh, that's going to be planted with native grasses, uh, native shrubbery on, on the embankment, uh, again, some native trees, uh, sweet gums, black gums. Um, continuing around the west side, we also have uh, some native plantings, uh, shrubbery, primarily in nature, and some additional uh, plantings along the riparian corridor uh, along the Eversource right of way. All the landscaped islands, uh, they'll have, again, at least one or two deciduous trees, depending upon the size of those islands, ornamental grasses, perennials, uh, and a buff-colored river rock, uh, not mulch. In other words, Kevin, 
find that along the C L and T, the minor line along there. You're not proposing economies to protect the people people on Middletown Ave. The reason I'm asking that is this commission has had a lot of problems with the other end of Middletown Ave, uh, with people concerned of what's going on in their area. And so I was wondering why you might not be doing that. Do you think it's too far away from those houses? No, I think it's more with what's going to be approvable by Eversource. Um, you know, I, well, I, then on the inside of, of it, I mean, get, how, far, how far is the, uh, where you're planting and, and the right of way for the upper source versus your own one? Uh, can you, I mean, can, where is it? <coughs> is that, the, that the, right the edge easement? right there? The, the easement is right here. So it's okay. partially so down it. the drive aisle. Yeah. Um, so it's everything east of that line that you just. This is this is 25 feet wide, that green space. So all the plantings are within 25 foot buffer along that easterly property line. This area here, that's wetlands, primarily Phragmites, and and that elevation is 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 lower. Another thing that I, I think the board could consider or should consider is is that not only this area here where uh, we're planting all of this stuff, but just past this line is the railroad track that is now running, hadn't been running in quite a while and now is running. And that track is elevated quite high. And when you stand currently in the lot, which is you know, roughly the same height that it's going to be when it's finished, and you look this way. Now, again, I didn't go in the backyards and look this way, but when you look this way, you see the second stories of the houses that are closest to the railroad track because they're sunk down. So what I don't think is going to happen and what I would like the board to, to keep in mind is that these people on Middletown Avenue, and I appreciate that they're going to be looking at something different. I think that something different, though, is with these 15-foot trees and a nice parking lot and two very nice buildings as opposed to a 1970s falling apart with graffiti on it and overgrowth that took us almost a million dollars to clean up the site <laughs> to get rid of all of the tires and trees and everything that was in this area over here. I'd be hard pressed to think that there'd be anybody in, even in the audience tonight, and I would love to meet them if they are from Middletown Avenue that said that their view isn't getting approved a thousand percent with what we're doing. But I would like to consider, I, the main point was is that from here looking this way, you can't see their yards. So when people get out of their car, we're not going to be able to see people picnicking. And when they're picnicking, they're not going to be able to see the cars in our lot because of the topo of the railroad track being raised up and their properties are kind of down on the houses that are on this side. So I'd just like you to consider that as well. Yeah, and I don't know if this is where George was going, but I guess my primary concern on, on that whole area is, you know, not so much the view shed because it will be an improvement. It's 615 sets of headlights shining on them that hadn't been there before. Yeah, and, and again, I agree, but I, I, I think the answer or the explanation that I brought, which is that the railroad tracks are much higher than where the headlights are going to be, I think that you're not going to get those headlights shining directly on the homes. Be, you know, I, you'd have to go out there and, you know, see the landscape for yourself, but trust me, I've been out there a lot in the last three months. You can't see the back doors or the sliding glass doors of the houses that are on, that are closest to the railroad tracks. It must go up over there because the houses that are on the other side of the street are a little higher. Um, but, you know, we're, again, we've been good neighbors to everybody that we've done everything on South Saint Highway and we have multiple projects. We do take into consideration all of that. So, but I do appreciate the concern and we have looked at it. You're going to hear shortly uh, from Mr. Garrow uh, discussion about grade utilities, uh, storm drainage, and so forth. But I think it is important to note, since we're talking about headlights, grades, um, this portion of the parking area abutting this easterly line is about six to eight feet lower than the existing grade along that railroad line. So I, I'm not saying the neighbors aren't going to be able to see the buildings. Um, certainly they will. Um, certainly they'll be able to see some of the parking, but I don't think from this row of parking here they're going to have headlights shining directly in their houses. Now here where the Phragmites is, that's a possibility. 
Um, but this whole area here is significantly depressed below existing grade. So I, I think that's important to know. Um, and again, I'm not asking for any landscape waiver as part of this plan. Uh, in terms of site lighting, uh, basically we have three types of fixtures. Uh, we have some uh, wall mount lights on the west side of uh, the phase one building as well as wall mounts on the rear of uh, the phase two building. We have some post mounted luminaires uh, in the front of each of the buildings, uh, more of a pedestrian friendly uh, post mounted luminaire. Uh, if you will. Uh, the remainder of the site lighting uh, is arm mounted uh, fixtures. Uh, everything is full cutoff, LED. Uh, the post mounted luminaires, um, the poles, they'll be set on a concrete base. Uh, overall mounting height about 18 feet. Uh, the freestanding poles along the perimeter of the parking and within the center, uh, they'll be at a mounting height of about 21. Um, the finish, uh, I don't think there's been a final color selected yet. Um, my guess would be it would be either dark bronze or, or black. Uh, that's still to be determined uh, by the owner and probably in conjunction uh, with input from the architect. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, what the uh, arm mounted looks like. Again, it's LED fixture, very sleek design, uh, very modern looking. And this is a catalog cut of what the post-mounted luminaire uh, would look like. And again, the fixture is all mounted in the top, everything full cut off, shining down. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Garrow. Um, he's going to have a discussion on, as I mentioned, grade, storm drainage, utilities, uh, erosion controls. Kevin, so, on, on yes. architecture, uh, that's, that doesn't exist right now? That's proposed. That's what you're proposing. And the design review said yes? Correct. We do have to go back. I heard you had to go back to them. No? Yes. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes, no, we do. Because, in other words, that's not final then. Not 100 percent. They, they've approved oh. it basically in concept. There's the, some the color and everything. I believe there's some fine architectural features they want to have additional input on. They did ask us to come back. I can explain a little but further on that as well. More, Mr. Chairman, to say later on this. Sure, sure. And and I kind of want to get through the presentation too, but I do have some big picture questions that I that may be more appropriate for you. Um, can you characterize, <clears throat> so I'm getting my, I'm trying to get my arms around how significant, how big this development is, right? And I'm not familiar, I, I don't know what the square footage is precisely, I didn't hear it, but characterize it compared to 1260. You've got these two buildings, is this twice what 1260 is? Is it half what 1260 is? The 1260 South Dean Highway building is about 52,000 square feet. Building number one, which is going to be single story, same as 1260, is proposed at 40,000 square feet. So about 10,000 square feet smaller. For phase one building? For, the, for, for building one, okay. which second. is also known as phase one. Phase two is a two-story building that's also going to be 40,000 square feet, but the footprint will be 20,000 square feet. So two, two levels of 20, okay. so which is about of, half the size of... In terms of activity, the future is 80,000 square feet in the future with the boat buildings compared to what is 50 out front, right? Correct. So there's 80 more going in the back Correct. in terms of activity. Correct. So, so the next question is, I, I think you're way above the parking needs. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you discuss that, talk to that? Why is that? Sure. It's, yeah. part, of, it's, it's part of the presentation. Okay. Um, so before you leave, Kevin, did I hear any landscape waivers? No. <laughs> 
Is that an oversight? Okay. Not an oversight for you. I worked hard. <laughs> It's like always a challenge to get the internal green, but I got it. You can add a couple, like just to <laughs> just <laughs> the waiver for the loading. Thank you. Thank you. What, what That's all I could do. <laughs> My landscaper is very happy. There's a lot of trees and bushes going in. Go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Corey Guerra with Coach Jensen and Miller. I'll, uh, <coughs> I'll be talking a little bit about grading, uh, drainage, utilities and erosion and sedimentation control. I'll try not to be too technical. Um, grading. Uh, as you've already heard, this is a floodplain, mostly floodplain, um, including the existing buildings that were there before. So the first uh, challenge was to um, obviously elevate the buildings above the 100-year flood. Um, which is the primary driver of what the final grading looks like. So both buildings are uh, above the floodplain. We also had to make sure that we did not reduce the storage volume in the floodplain. Uh, we also had to provide uh, code compliant access routes for any handicapped spaces. And obviously we had to ma match all the existing um, elevations around the property. As I said before, so the buildings, uh, which used to be below t elevation 29, which is the 100-year floodplain, now are at 30.25, so it's a foot and a quarter above the floodplain. Minimum by code is one foot. Um, that creates sort of a ridge along the middle of the site uh, where, the, uh, where the proposed drive is, and then it'll drain in both east and west directions because we had to come back as soon as we could in order to not reduce the volume in the floodplain. Um, as, there's a lot of talk about what's going on in the back. On the back side, that low point there is 10 feet below the grade of where the railroad tracks is. So if there was any concern about lights glaring in that direction, it's not going to happen. They're 10 feet below that elevation a good part of it, mostly where this thing, it goes from 10 feet, maybe down to five or six feet below grade. So those are obviously almost like a natural berm to prevent any lights from going into that, into the um, properties to the east. And that's about a foot above, you said? A foot Excuse above me? what it is today? Because we're trying to get above that. The building elevations are the, one. The, the parking lot elevation. The parking lot elevations are 10 feet below the grade matching, of the tracks. No, it's a little lower. I think Kevin mentioned it's about six feet right now. Okay. We're going even lower because we had to compensate for right. the flood storage. Okay. As far as drainage goes, there wasn't much there today. Um, it's been, uh, obviously it's been leveled off, but before they leveled everything off, there's really a couple of remnants of old drainage systems on the site. Um, actually, there is there is a drainage line that actually comes from those yards in those properties that drains towards our property. Their, their, pro their yards are lower than the railroad tracks, and they drains to the west. So part of our drainage system will pick up that drainage from those yards. Otherwise, it will just have a erosion created on our site. Um, there's three uh, squash pipes that cross the uh, drive from Silas Dean. Those have been there for a long time. Um, one of the things that we had to do is make sure that they were still in good condition and uh, somebody did go out there and evaluate them they're in fine condition so they're going to stay there <coughs> um, and there's uh, a remnant of of an outlet just to the south of that driveway today as far as proposed um, we've designed a system for a 10-year design but we are checked it for 25 year storm based on DOT requirements and it that's designed for 25 there's going to be two outlets proposed one is in the same location as the existing one and there'll be another one just to the uh, north of the new building at this location um, both outlets will be uh, provided with either a scour hole or riprap to avoid any erosion 
We're also going to be introducing four water quality structures within the system. That's to mitigate all the floatables, oils, grease, sediments. And they're all, those are based on the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Water Quality, water quality Manual. Um, the basins closest to those four, to the two outlets, will have four foot sumps as well. Uh, we've also introduced two infiltration systems for the roof drainage uh, at, a suggest at the suggestion of town engineer. And those will be designed so that all the roof will go in there and have a chance to permeate or percolate into the soil before, they, uh, before it outlets back into the system. Um, as far as utilities, um, Kevin mentioned that they're they're all around the site. There is a, an eight inch water line that is within the existing driveway. That's gonna be used primarily for the fire service for building number one. There's uh, eight inch and four inch mains coming in from Mill Street. Those will be used, those will be extended in. The eight inch will be used for fire on building number two as, as the four inch will be used for domestic and then the domestic four inch will loop around building two and go to building one. Um, there's a gas service that comes in from Mill Street that will be utilized. Power and communications will also come in from Mill Street. There'll be a pole right here that all the, all the utilities will be underground, obviously, including power and communications. All, all the utilities underground. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have located transformers and generators around the site for to serve the buildings. And uh, as far as sanitary, I think Kevin mentioned, there's an existing eight inch line today that crosses um, underneath the tracks and goes to Middletown. And we'll be tying the, the proposed sanitary into that line. Of course, it's gotta go to MDC for final approval. Um, We've, uh, we had an extensive uh, ENS control plan that went through wetlands a couple of times and uh, it was approved. I'll give you a little bit of information about it. Um, uh, we're providing silt um, fencing and hay bales along the sensitive areas, along the, along the brook to the, uh, to the east and to the south, and then the rest of the site, the perimeter will also be silt fenced. Um, there'll be silt, silt sacks provided at every inlet, whether it's existing or proposed. The construction entrance will be off of the Silas Dean Drive. Um, we've also incorporated two temporary sediment traps. Um, basically, one is for phase one and one is for phase two. The one for phase two will stay in effect until building number two is ready to go. And there's also an extensive um, maintenance schedule during and post construction. Um, we have uh, re obviously received comments from planning, engineering, and fire, and those have been responded to as of today. We submitted the responses back to the planner. At this point, I think I'll turn it over to our traffic engineer, who will give you a... The fire marshal had a uh, comment on uh, fire sign out front. Yeah, yes, 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 I'm suggesting putting fire fire lane um, signs so that people don't park there. Oh, okay. He wants fire lane right signs at certain places, which we have no objection to. One quick question. This is... Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this like a like a global low point on Silas Dean? Because I know at some points during some peak storms we get overtopping of the drainage systems. Like I think that was before the that was before the MDC did all the corrective measure because they had stormwater and sanitary going into the system. Okay. A lot of infiltration. So that all the work they did out there supposedly is going to mitigate okay. mitigate that. So. I, because when you said like the squash pipes are, are fine, I was just making sure that that wasn't something that was potentially backing up and causing no. that kind of issue. No, no. Okay. Thanks.
Thanks, Corey. Um, again, I'm Mark Fertucci. I'm a senior transportation engineer at Fuss and O'Neill, also a registered professional engineer in Connecticut and a professional traffic operations engineer as well. Uh, Fuss and O'Neill did prepare a traffic impact study uh, for this medical office uh, development, so I, I just want to briefly describe uh, our findings with you tonight. Um, again, just to uh, orient you to the site, the uh, site is located on uh, the east side of the Silas Dean here. Um, let's see, this is um, Mill Street here running um, along the right side of the, uh, of the plan. So um, Silas Dean up here across the top and Middletown Avenue across the bottom. So you know, one of the benefits this site has uh, in comparison to some other sites along the Silas Dean is we have that secondary access point out to Mill Street. As you know, in the peak hours, it can take a while to be able to make a left-hand turn out of a driveway onto the Silas Dean. So having this secondary access um, onto a much lower volume roadway, uh, enabling people to travel up Mill Street to the, the traffic signal uh, at Silas Dean um, is uh, definitely a benefit for the site. Um, so as part of our traffic study, we did look at um, a couple intersections in the study area. Um, Mill Street and Middletown Avenue was reviewed. It's an all-way stop intersection. Do expect some traffic will be entering from this direction. Um, our future site driveway uh, intersection with Mill Street was reviewed. Uh, the intersection just off the plan here of Mill Street and uh, the Silas Dean Highway, which is a, a signalized intersection. That signal was just recently uh, upgraded by the DOT. Um, there's now advanced left turn phasing on all the approaches at that intersection, so that has improved operations there. Um, and then we also re reviewed our, our site driveway here, our shared site driveway uh, to 1260 Silas Dean and um, the Southerly uh, site driveway as well. It's opposite uh, Hewitt Street. Quick question. Sure. The Boyden was incorporated into what you're saying, right? That's correct. The full use yeah. of the Boyden. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I thought it was. I wanted to be sure. And I, I guess the other question is, was Middletown Avenue open for through traffic when you did your study there? It was, yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we, did, we did, as far as the traffic volumes that we utilized in this study, um, we did prepare the traffic impact study for the Borden as well. So we had done some counts in 2017 um, at uh, Mill and Middletown and Mill at Silas Dean. So... Um, we were able to use those traffic counts, and then we conducted some new traffic counts in, in 2019 at the, the two site driveway intersections at 1210 and 1260 uh, Silas Dean. So um, those counts um, did indicate the peak hours of traffic out there were 745 to 845 in the morning and 430 to 530 in the afternoon. So those were uh, the peak hours that we utilized um, and analyzed in this study. We assumed a design year, build year of 2021. Um, so we did go ahead and grow all of our traffic counts by a half a percent per year to bring them up to that 2021 background condition. Uh, that growth rate was provided by the DOT planning division. Um, we also included that traffic from the, uh, the Borden, uh, 111 residential units. There is 11,500 square feet of retail and restaurant and it's under construction. So. All that traffic is in our background. Um, and we also, um, I wanted to note, there's some all other road improvements uh, uh, proposed on Mill Street. The MDC came through there and did their work. That road's going to get reclaimed and, and milled and repaved. There's also some minor widening that's getting done on that road in the westbound left turn lane. Uh, the Mill Street approach to the Silas Dean Highway is getting extended to 175 feet. That was a condition of approval for the Borden. So that will provide some more uh, storage for traffic um, that's exiting this site as well. As far as the, uh, the traffic that will be generated by this development, we did utilize rates provided in the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual. This is an industry accepted resource for determining traffic generation for various land uses. For the medical office use, um, it indicates the 80,000 square foot uh, building will generate 173 entering and 49 exiting trips in the morning peak hour and in the afternoon peak hour, 78 entering trips and about 199 exiting. Um, as far as the distribution of traffic, we anticipate 
Uh, about 40% of those trips will come from the south on the Silas Dean Highway, 30% uh, from the north, and the other 30% entering from Mill Street and uh, Middletown Avenue. So we took, um, took those volumes, we took our background volumes, we added it to our tri trip generation volumes, uh, site-generated traffic volumes to get our build uh, year condition uh, combined traffic volumes. And we then ran intersection capacity analysis, each of our study area intersections to compare the operations before the development uh, goes in versus after the development goes in. Um, as you know, when we do our analysis at intersections, we get uh, those intersections we rate with a level of service. Uh, it's a report card type scale from A to F, uh, or A is a condition of very low delay and efficient traffic operations. A level of service F would be a high delay, um, longer delays, more driver frustration out there. So typically the DOT will uh, consider level of service D or better as being an acceptable operation. Uh, so the analysis did reveal that at the, um, the Silas Dean and Mill Street intersection, the signalized intersection, uh, that operates acceptably at level of service C and D in the background condition. It will continue to do so. In the build condition, there's no reduction of level of service projected at that intersection. Uh, at the Mill Street in Middletown Avenue, the all-way stop intersection, that's operating as well, uh, acceptably at level of service C or better, and will continue to do so in the combined condition. Um, our driveway at Mill Street has, uh, was projected to have uh, efficient level of service A and B operations uh, during both peak hours. The existing uh, driveway to, for 1210 Silas Dean uh, that we will be sharing access with, that driveway had more significant delays in the peak hours. Um, there are some operations uh, of down to level service F. Um, the entering, that's for exiting traffic. The entering traffic uh, was uh, efficient at level service A and level service B. So um, that exiting traffic, that delay, you know, it's a common condition on the Silas Dean Highway for unsignalized driveways in the peak hour. Um, it's, it's particularly the left turn movement that's dif the difficult one to make. The right turn is a more efficient operation. Um, we do have uh, the driveway is wide enough for two lanes. It's not currently striped as two lanes, so we are proposing that driveway be restriped to provide exclusive left and exclusive right turn lanes. Um, and I also wanted to reiterate, you know, if there are uh, delays or are queues forming on that driveway, again, uh, visitors to this site have the option and the opportunity to use the Mill Street driveway, uh, which is projected to have very little delay, very little queuing, and they can exit there and use the traffic signal to make a turnout onto the Silas Dean uh, Highway um, if, there is a, if there is queuing that forms there. Um, did want to briefly touch on two more things. We did measure intersection site distances from both site driveways uh, in accordance with DOT criteria. Um, and the site distances were measured to exceed DOT criteria based on the uh, existing roadway design speeds um, for the driveway onto the Silas Dean. The driveway onto Mill Street, there was some overgrown vegetation there. We had some trouble measuring it, but when you remove that vegetation, which will, when you construct a site driveway, most of that vegetation has to be removed. Upon <coughs> removal, there will be um, efficient or su sufficient site distance uh, looking in both directions. You should be able to see out to the Silas Dean looking to the left and down to Middletown <coughs> Avenue looking to the right uh, for safe egress from that driveway as well. Uh, we looked at the latest three years of crash data from the Yukon Crash Repository uh, at each of our study area intersections, and uh, we did not identify any abnormal crash patterns, frequencies, or severities in the area. We didn't see anything out of the norm for a, um, an arterial roadway such as the Silas Dean. Um, so just again to conclude, uh, we really only had two recommendations um, for this traffic study was the clearing and the trimming of vegetation, um, which should be largely done just simply by the construction of that driveway on Mill Street, and then also the restriping of the site, site driveway onto the Silas Dean to provide exclusive left and right turn lanes. Uh, upon implementation of those improvements, the conclusion of our traffic study was that the proposed medical office will not have a significant impact to traffic operations in the study area. 
There's one more thing I wanted to, to note. Um, that based on the size of the site and the number of parking spaces, uh, actually the site already has an existing uh, state traffic administration uh, major traffic generator certificate. I believe it expired at one point. Uh, but we do have to go back to OSTA, the State Traffic Administration, for an administrative decision review for this project. Uh, we do anticipate it will be able to be reviewed administratively since we're not proposing any off-site improvements on, uh, on uh, the Silas Dean. Um, but the DOT will be taking a look at this uh, as well uh, should this receive uh, town approval. They, they um, consider an F condition on an intersection. Does it need traffic light? Uh, that or something that that drive slows it down. Yeah, you know, you know, the thing is, um, virtually every driveway on the Silas Dean is level service F. That's <laughs> unsignalized during the peak hour. Um, there are two traffic signals in fairly close proximity to this intersection. The one to the south, I believe, is less than 500 feet, and there's uh, the Mill Street signal is maybe eight or 900 feet to the north. So. Uh, it's not something that the DOT would um, would approve, uh, having another traffic signal in the corridor so close to the other signals. Um, so in these situations, what we look, look like to do is we look at access management, which we've done here. We're combining access with existing access, and we're also providing that second access to Mill Street to get people out to the signal. So uh, again, it's something that other sites don't have the benefit of along this corridor. Don't you think that traffic will shift more to Mill Street than you're maybe predicting? I hope it does. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've been conservative. We've been conservative in, 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 in sending more. No, no, I'm saying to Mill Street and then left out to the signal, you know. Oh, okay. it's, uh, it's a fairly short distance from that driveway. From the driveway up Mill Street to the Silas Dean is maybe only three or 400 feet to get to that signal, so. And they're lengthening it. <laughs> they're going to lengthen it when we town repave it. That turn lane is going to be extended. Yeah, that's a, that was a condition of approval from the board, and so right. that. The MDC money, yeah. <laughs> Joe. Did you do any kind of study to figure out uh, what the largest amount of cars would be parked on the site at any one time? Um, Mike is going to talk next about the parking. Um, so I can, uh, you know, if you have any other questions on traffic, I'll answer them now. Otherwise, I'll turn, I will turn it Do over you, to Mike. As part of your study, I'm just curious, did you determine <laughs> what the full day volume of trips in and out would be over the course of a business day for this use? The, um, this, the IT manual does have a, a, a um, 24-hour traffic volume. I didn't um, include that in the, in the. Yeah, in the. Okay. Yeah. I I can give you the ITE number, and then Mike's got some information as well. I just don't have it with me right now. Do you have any questions for the traffic guy? Yeah. Yeah. So, not being a traffic engineer, um, categorically, the DOT would basically prohibit a traffic light there, out of the out of the uh, the the road that comes out of the Puritan, called Puritan yeah. Road. They would just based on the proximity to the other signals, but there's also volume warrants. And um, I'm not, while we didn't do a full warrant analysis, I'm not even certain the volumes would have warranted the signal there. So, so but the question was you indicated they would categorically deny it. Yes. No they, matter they what the volume. I haven't approached them, but you, you have, yeah, they've, they've. Since, uh, since we own uh, both 1260 and 1190. Uh, we came before the board when we uh, enlarged the 1260 building uh, six years ago. We were here, and 15 years ago, we were in front of the board when we built the two buildings on the 1190-1206, which is the Liberty Bank. And both times when we went to, to the state and asked for the traffic light, we got denied for that same reason. If you, from what we call Puritan Drive, which we'll have to think of a new name for, but that access road, when you take that left, you only have to go one building. The next building is the traffic light. Um, and then, like he said, the same. It's only 800 feet to Mill Street the other way. So they just, they wouldn't stack the cars up. We, but we've been there and we asked. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, it may be in the report. I didn't immediately see it. Can you characterize the split of directions leaving the site 
south on Silas Dean, north on Silas Dean, out the back way to Middletown Avenue? Yeah, it, we had uh, we projected, and this was just based on existing traffic volume distributions as well as just the layout of the network and where the 91 ramps are. And you know, we have projected about 40% of the traffic will arrive from the Silas Dean from the south, from the Rocky Hill, um, and then 30% from the north, and then we had 30% projected coming from Mill Street or Middletown Avenue from the north, from Route 3 and the, the 91 interchange there. So uh, roughly, you know, it's about 70% of the traffic coming from the Silas Dean overall and a bit 60% from the north, 40% from the south. Thank you. Those are similar distributions to what was used on the Borden that the DOT, uh, the Planning to, uh, Bureau of Planning had approved as well. I just had a quick question. I know you sure. had the 0.5% mm -hmm. increase, but the initial incorporated the Borden and all that, and it, so the it, it incorporated the traffic that was going to be generated from that development? All right, so what we did is we took the initial count data, volume data, we grew it with a half a percent per year, and then we added the site-generated traffic from the board and okay. on top of that. And, and the adjacent uh, building? Uh, yeah. Right, <coughs> yeah, correct. For the board and complex? Yeah. Yeah, actually it was right, it was interconnected, there was some work on the adjacent site. Yep. Okay, not seeing any additional questions at the moment. We'll let okay, you keep great. going. Thank you, I'll Thanks. turn it back to Mike. Actually, we're going to go uh, to the architect, Charles Nightbark. Good evening. For the record, Charles Nyberg, Office Shadler Selnow, 5 Waterville Road in Farmington. Uh, we have, you've, you've heard about the buildings. The first one that we are going to be constructing would be the single story, uh, 40,000 square foot roughly footprint. Uh, it'll be, again, structural steel frame, uh, coal form steel exterior walls. Uh, the roof will be flat but pitched to the east. Uh, the portico entrance is not a requirement for this type of building. It's not going to be an outpatient surgery center, so we don't need a physical drop-off. But it was decided that this would identify the entrance at the building, and so we have left it. And in fact, the two-story building also has a similar portico share on it. Uh, the layout in front of you was developed with uh, Starling Physicians who is going to be occupying 30,000 square feet of the building. They also occupy some portion of 28,000, 28, uh, is that the square footage? <coughs> at 1260. At 1260. So they have about 28,000 square feet of the uh, facility at 1260 Silas Dean. They also, as was mentioned, were here tonight for approval of the daycare. Uh, they are the ones who wanted to develop a daycare center that would, although mentioned that it would be strictly for this building, it would also serve the employees who are in the uh, 1260 building. Uh, the daycare center is about 5,000 square feet. We have two classrooms for preschool of, two, of 20 children each an infant room of eight children and a toddler room of eight children uh, with the requisite program areas based on the uh, daycare, uh, state, state of Connecticut daycare requirements. The entrance to the daycare would be to the east uh, with associated parking. And on the site plan, the area, the area to the east of the building, this green space, that would serve as the outdoor required play area and separate it into two components, one for the preschool children and one for the infant toddler. 
Uh, the uh, program space that we developed with Starling was based on some providers that at the time were interested in occupying the building. That is still up in the air as far as what the final mix of uh, providers will be in the building, uh, looking at it almost like a medical mall. And the exterior will be uh, an ephus uh, with stone base of various colors. Again, your comment about colors, that's still something we have to go back to. Uh, the uh, design review with final color selection and the material for the bottom for the stone, uh, that will be done. The second building is similar to the first in the sense of the ephus and a stone base. It's a two-story building. It would have an el two, elevator, two elevators and stair exits. Uh, as was mentioned in the uh, discussion about the site, the lower level of that building would be used for parking. And the upper two floors would be set up for uh, office space, again, to be determined as to how that layout ultimately would develop based on the occupancy. Trying to keep it simple as far as the architecture goes. I know you don't like it, but tell me what the uh, problem is. <laughs> No, I, I, I was concerned with the uh, rendering of the uh, outside of the building. I also heard that my friend for 60 years on the design review, Joe Hickey, um, mentioned to you folks during their discussions, and of course we don't sometimes get to hear these comments, but I think this was a good one. He suggested and wondered if you are going to uh, consider brick in the design here, in like a campus situation with, with the uh, 1360 and these buildings. We, <laughs> and I don't know what your answer and why you've gone well, this way. Well, I will answer it. Uh, we heard what they said. Uh, the gal who was the, I forgot her name, she's on the design review committee. Her comments had to do with the vernacular of what was going on in the area. Did we want to use brick? Did we want to try to bring that same feel to these buildings. And our comment was these buildings are so far away from the campus, if you would, or the building on Silas Dean, in our opinion, as well as the bank, and that anything on Silas Dean in this area did not merit any, in my opinion as an architect, did not merit any, any trying to emulate what was there, material or look. So we were trying to set our own look with these two buildings using these materials. This was our campus, our look. It's at the back of the site, and that's my answer. That's how we arrived at what so we arrived at. The boundary line. Yes. We didn't see, if this were up near the street, I might, you know, if we were putting this building or a building where the parking lot is and putting the parking to the back, I might second guess it but we have developed this as, as I say, our own particular look. Color to be determined, final finishes to be determined. We'll go with an EFIS. The beauty of using the EFIS material is with the new energy code is this gives us a continuous surface of insulation. Although the, the, the foam insulation used by the EFIS is not great R value, it does develop that continuous insulation that we need by code and the stone base, whatever. But we, we thought about brick, but I think we've been able with the EFIS to give ourselves some pop. We can create movement with the elevations, whereas if we just simply went with brick, we've got basically a sort of a very bland look. I mean, if I, That's the way I see it, a little bland. No, I meant the bland buildings that are out there, not oh. this. So. This is no, <laughs> it's not one color. There'll be a series. There'll be a series of colors. We're we're creating elements that, if I did brick, I'd almost have to go with a color, a different color, a different color. So we're able with the ephus. Ephus has a myriad of colors. Ephus is the. It's not a. It's not a limestone. It's not a marble, but it's a material that is used today. 
uh, to, Im to give those looks, to make it look like something that it isn't, that you couldn't afford in this type of building to go with a marble or a granite or what have you. So uh, we felt this was the... Yeah, I just wanted to add that from the distance there and the rendering the way it is, what you can't see is that everything north of the stone is going to be three colors, not one. If it was one, I may agree with you, that's yeah, bland. Three different shades? There's color? going to be three different color, colors shade, color. above. Uh, Again, the, on a smaller scale, the, this rendering has some, I don't, did, do you have this in your package by any chance? Say, is, it, is it part of these packages you can direct them to? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I think those should be in color. Uh, and, and I will say again while he's searching that um, we do have to go back before design review. We did get approval condition that we brought back, which we didn't have that night, the stone and the three colors that we're using for their approval. <clears throat> and when uh, the gentleman that you mentioned asked about the brick, the other thing that we mentioned is, is that in the front building at 1260, that's a multi-tenanted building. We have seven different tenants in that building, including a, one of the largest radiologists in the 860 area code, ProHealth Physicians, which is separate from Starling. <clears throat> so as we are trying to make this a campus-like setting, the campus-like setting is supposed to be just at 1210. We're not really trying to um, tie this to 1260 and we were afraid that the brick you know would tie that back to 1260 and because 1260 needs to have its own identity because it has seven tenants that aren't our, are all starling so that was also the consideration and part of the answer that we gave for, for design review the, I see it more than I see it all the way up to the Borden and even maybe across the street I mean I see this whole area as being a municipal area that it's like a small town, and uh, some of the architects should have elements in it. And I, I don't actually, disagree. I mean, the, the city planner, state planner, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, no, no I, and I appreciate your feedback, absolutely. I would say that the board and certainly uh, must have took your recommendations because that definitely doesn't look like 1260 Silestine Highway. And that's no, the I didn't mean to make it all brick. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. No, no. Sorry, Charlie. Wait. Oh, that's okay. Just a quick question. Sure. Uh, if you use EFIS, does that give you gives you more ability if in the future you decided when you wanted to renovate the building in 10 years or change, you can change the color more simply than if it was a brick building, it gives you more versatility of EFIS you, as opposed to brick? You, you do have an opportunity Absolutely. after a period of time. And again, we're going with an EFIS material that is one of the smoothest you can get. The older EFIS used to have a wormy finish and it would, it would degrade with, with uh, road saw or environment black. It would tend to blacken out. This looks like a very smooth stone hmm. material, but you are able, after a period of time, to change the color, whereas brick is brick. And is my understanding clear with that type of material that if at a later point in time you wanted to add more trim or change the look of the building for you know an upgrade, it's easier to do that than with brick because you could correct that material? Absolutely. Good? I'm good if okay. you're good. Any questions? I had a question. Um, signage on the site, I don't know if it's in your discipline, but will there only be entrance signage to the site or will there be like site signage for the daycare or whatever the, this is? In what, the area? We have, what we have noted on the one building that will be started first is that we do have a signage above the, below the portico for Starling Physicians. I'm not at liberty to speak to whatever site signage may be <coughs> out there, directional signage. There certainly should be something that's provided to direct. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been told by Close Jensen and Miller that uh, we would need to come back with a total sign package for the entire property uh, to be approved at a later date. So I'm not sure that we're at liberty to speak as to where Starling may put their sign. I will say just in general that there is a sign out uh, at the intersection of Puritan Drive and Silestein Highway that's existing. Uh, and that sign is, you know, proposed to be reused for the site. Uh, if, you, if you look there now, it's blacked out because people were still coming even when there was no building looking to buy couches. <laughs> Dave, there is, a, there is also on the 
plan as you come into the site over the bridge <clears throat> on the left hand side there's a uh, designated location for a directional sign so there is a spot I'm on one of the islands for that the sides of yep. the building. it doesn't seem like you could put signage on it easily without destroying the look so i was asking the question yep all right all set all right i just want to speak quickly um about the uh parking because i suspect that everyone on the board wants to hear why we're going to have extensive parking so let me speak about that Excuse me? You'll be talking about your three sites, don't you? Uh, sure. Okay. <clears throat> so there were comments uh, that we received back from the town engineer and the town planner with regard to the parking, and, and I understand their concerns. First, let me say that um, this is the first time in my 20-year career that I've had to articulate why we need more parking for a project. <laughs> uh, we almost always <laughs> are squeezing more square footage of the building in and coming for a waiver to lower the parking. So I feel a little awkward asking for more parking because uh, it's the first time. Um, uh, Blacktop, as you all know, brings in no revenue for a uh, property owner and landlord. And over the cost of the property to maintain it, plowing, striping, pothole, sweeping, they're all expenses. So it's not an advantage to have the extra parking uh, in the long run. Um, the town engineer asked for data to support the need, suggesting an ITE trip generation data which Mark talked about uh, briefly. Um, the, this data with all its charts and averages and sample sizes is one way to look at this um, uh, that's done, you know, and we had it done by our consultants. Uh, I prefer live data from property that I actually own around the country uh, as it could be more realistic and tangible. Uh, let me explain. <clears throat> uh, a quick summary of the ITE data uh, shows the sample size of 117 sites across the country and peak parking period uh, for those 117 sites. The average parking was 4.3 spaces per thousand. 85% of those sites had a peak period of 4.59 per, per thousand. Uh, the rates for those 117 sites ranged from 0.96 all the way up to 10.27 per thousand, meaning that there were at least a few outliers in the 117 sites sampled uh, that had higher rates in the eight to 10 per thousand range. Uh, interestingly enough, I own two of those buildings. I don't know if they were included in the survey, but they do exist. This is why I prefer live data. This chart <clears throat> shows six properties all in my portfolio that I own, all medical, and all but one with higher than six per thousand square foot. Um, as you can see, and I hope you can read, I made it as big as I could get it. The first site is in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a Fresenius dialysis. It has 52 parking spots on a 10,500 square foot building for a ratio of 4.95. The second building, that I, and that building is run by the Vanderbilt University system. The next building that I own is a medical building in Cleveland, Tennessee. It's the Tennessee Health Network, the largest health network in the state of Tennessee. It's a multi-tenanted building that has 130 spots for 9,600 square feet or 13 per thousand. I also own a building in Griffin, Georgia, which has the Spalding and Northside Hospitals, the two hospitals that support the entire state of Georgia. That has 131 spots for a 21,000 square foot building, or 6.23 per thousand. I also own the building here in Connecticut in Wolcott. It's uh, a total building uh, that's uh, occupied by St. Mary's Hospital. That building has 90 parking spots for a 13,000 square foot building or seven per thousand. And the last building that I own is on Dale Road in Avon. It's a multi-tenanted doctor building that has Hartford Hospital affiliated practices. It has 150 parking spaces for 18,000 square feet or 8.3 uh, per thousand. So I have multiple examples just in properties that I own that show that the trend for medical property is to have an abundance of parking as the medical uh, profession expands. Um, also, um, next door to you, uh, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. I, I, yeah. I'm getting to that. It's in my speech here. Let me finish. Oh, okay. <laughs> I looked at it the other day at about three in the afternoon. How many times did you circle the lot? Down to the back to the, uh, yeah. to the river. Right? I'm getting to that. Yeah, <laughs> Only the single tenant dialysis with 19 stations is under, and that's almost at five per thousand. 
Uh, this live data shows that many multiple practice medical buildings have higher parking ratios. Also on the chart is the building that I own at 1260 Silestein Highway with its six per thousand. Have you ever visited the building for an appointment? George obviously has. Uh, there are several, sometimes with a lot of so full that people have to wait for a spot. Uh, since the main tenant at the 1260 building, Starling Physicians, is expanding into building number one at 1210 and taking 30,000 square feet, they were very concerned with parking. Uh, it came up more in the lease negotiations than the rent did. Uh, and I made them a promise that parking would not be a problem at their new location. Just to give you an idea uh, of an employee and patient flow at a well-run, highly successful medical operation today, I'll show you the following chart, and this goes to what somebody over here had said about trips per day. <clears throat> so at 1260 Silestein Highway, it shows the list of tenants that we have, starting with Starling Physicians, the Infusion Center, Jefferson Radiology, and so on and so forth, all the way down. The employee count for that building is 174. Out of those 174 employees, there's 24 doctors and APRNs. The patient seen per day by every tenant is 739 patients go to that building every day. <clears throat> patients per hour, that adds up to 111 patients per hour. So I just wanted to give you a feel of the reason why when George went to the building, it's hard to find a spot. Um, all of this met the code and the regulations that the town has when we built uh, the addition on 1260 and also when we built the buildings across the street. So it just says to me that even though you meet the criteria, it doesn't always mean you meet the need, which is why we're asking for more in, in this new 80,000 square foot facility. <clears throat> I just have a, a question. That's that building you said is at six per thousand, right? Correct. So I guess my only question is if if the entire day there's 739 patients in and out, and if per hour it's 111, right? You know, even if we assume that there's uh, some doubling up of the peak hour into the next hour, you know, do you know what the highest count? might be at any given how many spaces are in that lot in total did you say uh you know i, I don't know that i have that information Yeah, because i know it can i understand what you're saying about being tight to find a spot but i'm just trying to trying to do the math and saying if 700 are spread out over eight hours how are you gonna blow through six per thousand yeah. well i mean it's hard i think it's hard you know not to answer the question for him i think it's also hard on that site because i think a large portion of the employees at 1260 park behind the other building, or at least that seemed to be the pedestrian traffic on the two times that I tried to go down here to look at what's going on, is people right. parking at 7 o'clock in the morning behind the bank walking over to the medical building. That's correct. That was part of the approval process yeah, right. uh, on the site, was that we, when we expanded in the front of the building, the 8,500 8, square feet uh, six years ago, we also expanded the parking lot of the bank in the back and added parking. We also expanded behind and we rent currently rent property from the utility company so that we could expand the back. There used to be just a fire lane behind 1260. Now there's the fire lane and an entire row of parking, which is all um, employees. Um, and I just wanted to finish up by saying that since our approval with the Inland Wetlands Commission, um, where we had the same question about parking counts when we were in front of them, uh, we had actually redesigned the site and we lowered the parking count to the current plan of 610 spaces, uh, which you can find on sheet six of the current plan shows the 610 spaces. <clears throat> In the parking calculation at the 1210 site, as it was mentioned before, 36 of those spaces are located under building two, um, which were added only after we designed the site and realized that building two was going to be able to be raised off the ground uh, due to the you know, wetlands mitigation and uh, site grade and stuff that they can describe better than I can but so those 36 spots were uh, were added only after we raised building two uh, because of the grade and since the building footprint would have been in the same spot those spaces really don't represent additional blacktop coverage which is I think one of the things that the board is uh, interested in so if you were to take out those 36 spaces that puts us down to about 574 which is about 7.17 per thousand so um, I'm not sure that it's as egregious as, as maybe it's been thought about as people have been thinking. Um, 
I, I do not believe there are current regulations for maximum parking spaces. Like I said, this is the first time I've had to argue for this, but only a minimum. And I believe that I've demonstrated through stock data with the ITA and real life data at properties that I currently own around the country <coughs> um, uh, that abundant parking, specifically in medical properties, is needed. And I ask that you approve the project with the parking as shown. Thank you. And I, does that conclude? And I think at this point that concludes all of our presentation and we would welcome any questions. All right. So <clears throat> um, let me start by mentioning the documents you did that our town planner has put questions, has, re has uh, put forth some questions and I think you responded today. Okay. Um, and the town engineer put together some comments as well. Can whoever responded to them help characterize for us whether you know you accept it all, you're incorporating it, any concerns with that? And and then I'm going to ask the town staff if they've read it. There's there's town engineers in the back and mm -hmm. the planner is here. Well, since I wrote the letter, I guess I'll. I can respond. And, and there's lots of there's lots of issues, right? So of, just characterize of, it in general. Of, we don't have to go through them all. Basically, right? we incorporated, I would say, all of them. Um, there was explanations on some of them, like landscaping, why we couldn't put some where the uh, utility easement is or where the the railroad or in that area. Yep. Uh, one of the other ones that required an explanation was the um, one I think the town engineer asked for more sidewalks within the site. Um, and I did explain that when you look at the site plan, there's 2,000 feet of new sidewalk being put in. When you look at all the sidewalks around the buildings and extensions from the other driveways, um, we can't practically put any more sidewalk within the parking field because it would be horrendous to go up and down, up and down at every island. There's too many islands. So that arrangement within the parking field is similar to 1260. If you've been there yeah. and you park on the other, on the other by the bank, you've got to walk to the building yeah. along that walk path. So we have a similar situation there. But that's the only one where we sort of did as best we could. We could not put more sidewalks, physical sidewalks, within the site. But in the end, we end up with 2,000 feet of sidewalk. I think that's the only one we, everything else we said, we have no problem with. And if when... Uh, the planner or, or the engineer read them and they see anything else they might see, they, obviously we can accommodate them, but I, I didn't see anything in it that we could not accommodate. All right, thank you. Joe? I, I just have a quick question for the traffic engineer, which is you know, essentially the applicant's asking, I think, for about 28% more parking spaces than our regulations require. And my question is, if that's the real amount of parking that you need, does that tell us that the ITE trip generation manual on medical office may be underestimating the, the uh, amount of traffic for that use? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of these land uses in ITE, you get, they, they give you a range. You know, they give you a sample size. In this case, there are over 100 samples, and there was, there's quite a bit of a range. And then they average it out, and they give you 85th percentile, and... You know, it's it's a it's a guide to use as to uh, what you might need, but I think what we find with these uses are, you know, it it depends on the nature of the the medical office. You know, some may need more parking than others, so um, it's always helpful to have actual real uh, data, you know, real uh, data from other similar developments, which uh, Mike has provided that, and it's showing that this type of use is generating a higher parking need, you know, than than the average rate in ITE, but there is some support for those rates. The higher end of the sample size, uh, some of those some of those outliers are are more consistent with what he's proposing. So, just out of curiosity, did you do any actual recent counts at the entrance to the existing building at 1260 at peak hour to see, you know, how many are coming in and we going have the out? trips that are coming in and out um, from the driveway. I didn't do any parking. Occupancy right. counts. I mean, so. more from the driveway and how that compares to the ITE projections in terms of the existing building at 1260. I could do that. I, I'd have to look at it and you know, look at the calculation and as far as what's there existing, I haven't done it, but I can I can do it pretty easily. Yeah, I, 
was just curious if yeah. you had. Right. So it, it, the discrepancy begs the question of whether if there's more parking needed, practically speaking, is there more traffic coming than practically speaking by the ITE trip generation models, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, they're, they're calculated in the same way. There's a sample size, there's an average rate in, a, in an equation that's used. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, we're making a projection here, so it's, it's the best data we have, we have to go on. Um, parking, and one thing is parking and trip generation are not directly proportional, which some, some people tend to think there are. Well, if you have 600 spaces, you have 600 trips. You know, that's not, not how it works because um, you get people who arrive and depart. You get more in the peak hour, less during other hours of the day. Some, some may stay two or three hours, so they're not turning over that regularly. So um, it's not always a a direct correlation between the parking rate and the, and the trip rate, but. Rich? Just kind of following up on that, how many, how many trips do you expect to be generated from the site during the course of the day, not just the peak hours? I think that was something that the chairman had asked for. And second, how many employees do you anticipate working in the two buildings? You'd have to, as far as the trips during the day, I, the ITE doesn't have hourly data, we, you know, and it's got annual or 24 hour data and it's got the peak hour data. Um, typically, what we see with a medical office use, though, unlike, a, say, a general office where you have everybody streaming in in the morning and leaving in the afternoon, the medical office will tend to be more, uh, you know, evenly dispersed throughout the day because you have people coming in and out for appointments. So it's kind of like a, you don't see the big spikes, you just see it kind of steady throughout the day. And, right, and yeah, but I mean, cumulatively, it would be larger, right? Yeah, but I mean, as far as traffic impacts, it's the cumulative is it's more of what's happening at that moment. So, you know, if you get more people coming between 9 and 3, well, the background traffic on the Silas Dean isn't nearly as much as it is during the morning and the afternoon peak hours. So, you know, they yeah, I mean, you, you may have 80% of your traffic coming off peak, throughout the course of the day and they have a much easier time getting in and out. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I'm not overly concerned about background traffic on the Silas Dean. My the primary question is, you know, aimed at things like additional traffic on Middletown Avenue. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're estimating, you know, 600 parking spaces, I don't know how many employees, you didn't answer that. I don't know how many trips during the day, you didn't answer that. If 30% of them are going to be going out on a mill street, you know, you would have to assume that a majority of them are we going to going to the right rather than sitting at a different stop on the Silas Dean. And those, you know, those are just kind of incremental more cars on a street that we've had to be sensitive to, um, you know, recently. Um, you know, and if it's going to be 500, 700, 1,000 more cars during the course of a day, the whole day, you know, then, then it's probably better to know that than to, to be surprised. Um, and I guess the second question I had specifically on the board is in your report, you referenced the 111 units, but with the second building, it's 150. Does that change anything? No, I mean, it, it actually was, we took the full build condition from the, what the final proposal was for the board and the adjacent, um, I think it was 1160 was the adjacent building. There was some work done there, uh, pro additional space proposed there. So it was, it was all of it, the whole complex right. was, we basically worked off the build condition from that traffic study. Um, the number of additional trips on Middletown Avenue is about 60 in the highest hour of the day. Um, if the 30% projection verifies. Um, so that, as I mentioned, there's, it's a level of service B and C operation, the mill at Middletown. So there's a fair amount of reserve capacity at that intersection. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I just wanted to know the yeah. answer to the question. Right, so, yep. And the, and the number of employees, I think, yeah, is my I, guess. Yeah, I can add to, uh, to answer some of the more of the question there. <clears throat> uh, 
two things. One is this is going to be a two-phase project. We're going to build building one first and building two second. And um, it's proposed at this time that when we build uh, building one and put in most of the infrastructure that there'll be a, uh, there's an area, uh, I don't know if we have it on the map, but w building two, uh, we're not going to build all of the parking for building two right away. So I guess, and I can't say who's going to be in there because the reason we're not building it is it's still for rent. <laughs> um, but in, in the case where we uh, had some medical use that didn't generate as much trips as 1260 does, I guess that there could be some, uh, some re-review of the parking at that time, and we could look at it at that time. Um, you know, I can't say when we're going to build the building. I hope it's soon. Um, but we're not going to put all of the parking in, uh, including the 36 spaces that will be underneath building two. Um, so I guess there would be some opportunity to come back and look when we get a tenant for building two to see. But um, I, I honestly believe that through both the traffic study and the real life situation that happens right in front at 1260 and at the other properties that I own that, um, you know, the parking is needed. Um, again, it's an expense. I, I would, it's much easier to maintain grass. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't be asking uh, to have it if we didn't need it. No, I, I've been to the other building and you need it. Um, <laughs> the, the other question I guess, I guess I would have is that, you know, it's your expectation that these are going to be kind of normal business hour operations. It's not going to be anything that runs 24-7. Yeah, no, absolutely. The medical buildings that I would say, you know, uh, at 1260, for instance, we do have a blood lab there that opens up early, so there's some early traffic, you know, from 6 to 7, but the bulk of the traffic is 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you go to the lot, which I drove by today, to come here at like 5.30, it's a ghost town. For the uh, building that you do have leased, at, the first building that yes. you have leased, 40,000 square feet, do you know how many employees will be in that building? I can't say, but I, I would just, again, I would use this, the, the same size property that we have out front where they have 174 employees. So I guess there's the possibility. I, I, I you know, I, I don't know. They, they seem at 1260, it's kind of their MO to cram the doctors in and, you know, get as much space. There's uh, over the years, the 15 years, there's less and less closet space and more and more doctor's offices. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I would say, you know, that 170 to 180 range would would probably be an employee total, not necessarily doctors, but employees. Just for the first building or for, for the whole thing? I would say for building one because building one is a similar size to 12 to 1260 out front. Okay. And and that's using the doctors from all seven of those practices. There's 174 employees. Uh, if you look at my chart, I'm pretty sure out of the 170 something employees, over 100 of them are Starling. So before I forget, we need a copy of the chart for the record. Uh, yeah, I didn't bring any small ones, but I'm happy to leave the large ones. Or he can get it for you after. I just wanted to mention it while I'm thinking about it. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, big questions. Otherwise, I'd like to get to the public and get their thoughts. The snow shelf is mentioned, I think, from Corey's response to Mr. Gregory. Is that an issue? And would the snow shelf be away from the residential, away from the railroad tracks? Have you thought about that at all? Um, I'm living close to a school, and I hear the uh, plowing quite often. <clears throat> is that uh, relevant at all? And is in the question the same thing? Will the lighting have any effect on the homes or residential properties on the easterly side? During during plowing? Uh, plowing or at night, the lighting is lighting as well as plowing. Do you see that having any effect on the residential properties on the east of I, I think it was discussed that we're going to be using the full cutoff lights so they don't shine, you know, in the distance. So I don't think that there'll be any glare or over, uh, over uh, lighting of, you know, again, you have to, you'd, you'd be talking, With cutting across. Well, not on the elevations, but you'd have to have the lights cut across the, the buffer and then the railroad tracks before you'd even get to them and I don't think that I mean I'm positive and I'm not a lighting expert but I'm positive that our lights won't shine won't even shine on the railroad tracks okay Corey if you could show us where the dumpsters are too the garbage uh, dumpsters sometimes that's picked up early in the morning uh, yeah building one right there 
building two right here. Well, quite, a, quite, quite a ways away from. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's also designated areas for snow cover. For most small storms, you can probably, you know, use the islands and the periphery and, and then these larger areas here. And we have a node on the planet that says anything over three inches, bigger storms, they can Where put. Where are they now? Point them out, the two snow areas. Here. Right there. And there. Yeah. And then if there's bigger storms, typically they have to get them off the site within 48 hours because he needs the parking. There's no way they're going to leave it in the parking. Yeah, we, we have that situation currently at 1260. If you've ever seen when there, we have heavy snow, you'll see the payloader and the dump trucks taking it away. Load it up. Corey, quickly, I saw the gen set for building one. I couldn't find it on building two, the proposed gen set. For one and two, I saw the, the gen sets over near the dumpster on building one, correct? Yeah, it's over here. I it's could see I, there's a lot of overlay on building two. Where is it for building two? Uh, right in this area. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't see it. So, so Derek, I appreciate you coming today and, and uh, making yourself available. Do you have some thoughts that you want us to know that, you know, or some concerns that you want us to know? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Derek Greger. I'm the town engineer. Um, the only thing I wanted to, to make you aware of is the, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the parking area, uh, and I understand uh, the potential need for it given the facility out in front and the lack of parking there. Um, this originally came up during Inland Wetlands Commission review. The development as it stands right now is increasing the impervious area of the site. I mean, pretty much the whole site now will be impervious area. Um, I think it's going somewhere from around four acres to seven acres. So we got like a three acres of increased area, which is 75%. Um, the concern I have just from the town's perspective is as part of DEP's MS4 permit that the town works under now, one of the requirements of the permit is the town needs to try and reduce impervious areas within the town that are shedding to the Connecticut River, which is our uh, nearest impaired water body. So as part of the permit, the last couple years of the permit that we're coming into now is requiring the town to try and reduce impervious areas of 1% of all impervious area in town, 1% of it in the fourth year, 1% of it in the fifth year. So we're, our goal is to try and get a 2% reduction in impervious area, which reduces stormwater runoff uh, pollutants that are going to the river. So from the town's perspective, we are in our permit required to do the best we can with our projects and with private developments and how we regulate private developments. So with this application, I'm just, I just want to be sure if um, there's a need for it that is, it's clearly justified and I have good records as to why. Um, this came up, like I said, during the Wetlands Commission review. I had suggested maybe some of the outer parking areas are not built initially and added later if needed. Um, you know, we had some some thoughts were put out there regarding LIDs, low impact development, where um, maybe we do pervious pavers or do something that uh, will not go against what the permit is looking for, because we're actually going the opposite direction. This one project is going to put us back a little bit, so we have to make up this ground elsewhere. Um, the thing with the Inland Wetlands Commission is, uh, you know, the parking study hadn't, the traffic report hadn't been done. We hadn't really gotten into that, so. I think as part of their presentation for Inland Wetlands, they came in probably with similar information and explained why, and it went through Inland Wetlands. But at that time, I had explained that I would want the opportunity to see the background data that they're using. Um, I understood there were other facilities that they were looking at as far as what the parking counts were and what the needs were. I haven't seen that data yet. I did ask for it to be submitted, so I haven't had a chance to review it. I hear what they presented tonight. I couldn't see it. Um, but I would, I would like the opportunity to be able to look at that and just have some, be able to give some feedback on the need. Mostly my perspective is looking at it from, like I said, the permitting needs of the town and what we need to meet. If they're going to increase the impervious area this much and there's a substanti they can substantiate the need, I just want to be able to have some documentation to, to, to put in my files as to why, you know, that need was there. Um, you know, the way the site's la laid out, there's some parking that is, quite far from both of the buildings. I, you know, I, I find it hard to believe that they're all going to be used to that extent. Um, you know, some of the questions that just jump into my mind tonight, just listening to the presentation, um, in regard to, you know, looking at square footage and parking spaces, I'm not clear. I didn't see the 
the presentation. I couldn't see the boards, but I don't know if it's, uh, are they looking at actual parking spaces to the size of the buildings, or are they looking at used parking spaces to the size of the buildings? Because there could be a discrepancy between what's available on site and what's actually being used, and we're trying to get more to what's really going to be needed. Are you uh, talking yeah. about the um, <clears throat> other sample sites that yeah. were dis discussed? You know, I, w I was thinking I simply missed it, so I appreciate you confirming that. I, had, I didn't really hear that either, but we'll follow up. Um, you've kind of touched on my, my chief concern in reviewing uh, the submission here is, is the, the amount of runoff caused by you know, the, the, the huge addition of impervious area. Uh, that's presented by this development. And while I think the developer has, has presented a case for um, his, uh, the amount of parking that uh, he's requested, I, my experience with the 1260 building would substantiate what he's, he's contending, but I'm really concerned about the, the, the level of impervious uh, surfacing on this site and how it's going, it, it really increases the amount of, of uh, runoff rather than absorption. Uh, I'm concerned as to whether or not there have been uh, alternative uh, surfacing uh, materials or technology that could be utilized to satisfy the applicant's needs and also, you know, meet not only the the um, uh, the state environmental uh, regulatory requirements that uh, you've mentioned, but also uh, just in you know, proper environmental management of, of our uh, you know uh, surface and subsurface uh, moisture uh, situations in in this area of town. So. Um, I'd appreciate any further comments that either you or the applicant can make with regards to th this concern. With regard to that, uh, when it initially came into Inland Wetlands, uh, we, I did make the comment and they did uh, agree to take the roof areas and put them into underground infiltration systems. Um, by our permit, if you can detain the first one inch of runoff from an area, which is called the water quality volume, they consider that a uh, disconnected impervious area. So we take basically, um, we take credit for those areas because we're not going to consider those as runoff because they're collecting the first one inch of runoff. Um, even with that, there still is a, a substantial increase in impervious area. There are alternatives, as I suggested, there are low impact developments that could, um, alternatives that could be worked into the plan, such as pervious pavers, pervious pavement, landscaped, um, you know, bioretention swales. There's different things that could be done that aren't included at this time. Um, I can't, you know, as far as the previous approval, it got approved um, with the understanding that, you know, we would look at this in a little more detail when we got the traffic report and got into actual parking and traffic counts, and that was, not developed at the time they went through inland wetlands. So this would be the time to address it if there's, uh, you know, concern with that. I think there's options um, that aren't included in the proposal as it stands. Um, Peter, do we, do, do our regulations have any standards as it relates to, uh, you know, uh, impervious surface area requirements, uh, restrictions thereof, or, or uh, you know, needs to be addressed uh, requirements? Um, <clears throat> we have basic requirements, you know, maximums on, on lot coverage and, and such, but n no specific um, uh, LID techniques or, um, you know, alternative pavement uh, options, you know, that level of detail. We just have the standard, uh, you know, lot coverage requirements um, depending on the zone. Also, it would it would tend to to me this uh, this application and uh, the ongoing changes in our own climatic conditions uh, would seem to me to uh, point to a need to re-engage our own uh, you know uh, plan of development to take into account this kind of situation. 
Is it, I mean, this yeah, is, I this think the, zo the zoning regulations could use a, uh, uh, an upgrade in, in that whole area, and uh, the town engineer and I have talked about that as an upcoming project. Just, just to add to that, uh, that is a requirement through our MS4 permit to incorporate that type of language or those type of criteria into our regulations so it becomes part of uh, the process uh, going forward. Um, just haven't gotten to that point yet to have the time to actually put them in. Um, but with some of the projects that have come through, some of the town projects we're doing, these are considerations that we're, we're having to make. Um, to the applicant's point, yes, usually you're, you know, we're not uh, complaining about too much parking, but times have changed in the way that's looked at, uh, particularly with the new s the state and the way they're looking at it um, globally for all municipalities that, you know, reduce, this is one of, this is really the main point of the permit, reduce impervious, treat your runoff that's coming off site. So we've been good in recent years about getting hydrodynamic separators and different type of water, water quality treatment systems put in, um, which is good. Um, but the next step is now we also have to look at this directly connected impervious area. And, and given that, you know, this is in the watershed that goes, it's at the low end of the watershed, it's going right into the river. Um, I just want to be sure that we are, if we're going to approve it as is, that we have good substantial need for it. Yeah, because this being so close, like, in order to be in compliance with, like, an MS4 or DCIA, in order to make sure we're not directly connected, we would need, like, a water quality swale or some sort of detention pond or something in that sort of north section in order to make sure it doesn't go right directly to the Gulf Brook. Like so, yeah, there's so different you, ways you of doing it. Reduce it to what was only required <coughs> and then do some water quality treatment to it before it gets to an actual impaired, or I forget what the term is. Is it like impaired? It's an impaired water, water body, yeah. yeah. Um, y yes, I mean, water quality is one thing. Um, retention on site is what they're looking for to yeah. keep the water quality volume on site and not let it go off site as runoff. So. As I said, they, they did make some accommodations during the previous review to put the building, what we consider clean roof runoff into the ground. Um, but, you know, even with that, there still is looking at how this affects our total. So what we have to do as the town, we look at all our impervious cover that we have so and how total, much of that is, is total impervious is what we look at from the town's perspective. As opposed to what's directly connected. Right. And then they look at how much of that is directly connected, which is di di directly drains into, um, into the water bodies and the watershed. Um, so what we have to do is we have to track it now. So we know our baseline number and every time a project adds new directly connected impervious area, we have to add to the number. Yeah. And then we can find projects that take off. So our goal is to get down 2% over the next couple of years and then 1% each year thereafter. That being said, the state you know, understands everything is what to the maximum extent practical. So, it's, you know, that, that, that gives us some flexibility that, you know, it's not a hard and fast, but we are supposed to be moving in that direction. And as we do our annual reports every year to the state, you know, we have to justify what, you know, demonstrate what we've had for applications, additions, subtractions, and, and why, um, which is why, you know, this is, uh, you know, just happens to be coming in at a time when we're looking at this and it's a, it's a big application and it has a big impact and um, just want these things to be fleshed out as part of the process. Uh, question for Mr. Panic. Uh, how, how many square feet was the building you tore down there? That building was 100,000 square feet. And did you, if you may remember, the steel structure that was pre-demoed <laughs> 10 years ago on the north end of that building? And it did have a roof on it at one time, just a roof. Yeah, that's not included in the 100,000 square feet. So, thumb it. What do you think? That's 20,000 square feet that was torn off that building, right? Well, that's what we thought until we got the bulldozer out there. The actual pilings and the foundation that the, those girders sat on went almost all the way to the fence uh, or within 10 feet of the fence where the dental practice is. So, at one time, it might have been even larger. But so, so, maybe it was 140,000 square feet of roof un and from what... Corey said it was uncontrolled runoff. It was just one of the whatever it was just wherever it went, it went because that was the Correct. engineering standards of the day. Correct. So you're going to have 60,000 square feet of roof space on this site if you build two buildings, right? Correct. So my simple math is in a controlled filtered system. So, and I, with all due respect, Corey, I look at this site as a whole of its history, which I have a pretty clear recollection of the water management and control is a 
light years ahead of where it ever was. And the way the surface was there, it was, it was a mess in that place. Yeah. And I, as far as water quality control and, uh, well, you know, and all due respect to the permit, but I just, I think you're really going in the right direction with this I and with that. parking spaces. Though. I appreciate that. To, in to in speak, relation to 1260, the parking spaces, the yeah. facts are the facts. Yeah. Well, what 1260 well, is today. Correct. And just to go backwards a little bit to what Mr. Dean had spoke about, <laughs> when we went in front of Inland Wetlands, I'm, a, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage because I didn't bring my Inland Wetlands guy tonight. He spoke at that meeting. But um, the amount of work that we're doing on the site to improve the wetlands and make that better, including all of the stormwater runoff, was far and above enough for the Inland Wetlands not even to question it. That's why they approved it. We went one meeting and they approved it. And again, I can't speak to the facts. I can only because I don't have that guy from the team here. But as far as, you know, what we're doing to the wetlands, what we're putting into the Gough Brook, he had a, a myriad of facts that, you know, made the project look, you know, far superior to what was there pr prior. I just would add, um, yeah, you know, they did accommodate that. I think just to your point, certainly I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a better runoff control situation than was there previously. What we look at is the, the delta, what was there for impervious and what they're putting in now. So there's a substantial increase is what I'm looking at. If we could get back, if we could design it so we get back to what, you know, impervious cover we had before and at least not have an increase, that would be desirable. Um, you know, I'm not saying we have to get, I'm not looking at for 2% reduction out of this project, um, but I'm, I'm just looking to make sure that we do everything we can to meet our needs as the, as the municipality with the permit that we have to enforce. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Sure. All right. Um, unless there's anything pressing public? Okay, good. So if you would, um, you know, give up the mic. Yeah. I'll turn to the public. Is there anybody in the public who wishes to comment on this? Come on up. Appreciate you uh, putting up with our questions for so long. <laughs> Hi, good evening. You probably remember me from the previous meetings that we all attended from the neighborhood regarding the restaurant that's to be built on the corner of Maple and Middletown Avenue. But unlike that project, I have not been opposed to this one. Um, could could you simply offer your name and address? Christine Jackamy, 417 Middletown Avenue. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Hold on a second. I've got things written up here. And, uh <laughs> Uh oh, my thoughts are on here. <laughs> Bear with me. Otherwise, I'll let someone else speak first until I can fiddle with this. Don't you just okay, hate here that? Here we go. That's what happens to my thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want to start again by saying that I've not been opposed to this project and that I did attend the wetlands meeting in the fall and heard the developer speaking at that time. And my impression at that time was that he's a caring and responsible individual based on what I heard him saying. I do, however, want to share my thoughts and concerns and hopes with the developer and with the members of this Planning and Zoning Commission. When I first learned that the Puritan Furniture Building was being torn down to make way for medical buildings, I was not alarmed, thinking that medical buildings would certainly be better than another high-rise apartment building in the area, such as the newly constructed Borden Building. But then in the span of about two days, the serenity and comfort of my backyard was completely destroyed. I live on Middletown Avenue. The railroad tracks are just beyond my backyard property. And beyond the tracks were trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and wildlife. That area has always felt very secluded, safe, quiet, and peaceful. I was quite shocked when I first noted the complete change to the landscape. All the trees and shrubs had been flattened. My beloved woods were destroyed. Everything was plowed down. The area was left wide open and exposed. I felt that overnight my home has been relocated from a su the suburbs to an urban location. I now see Silestine Highway and its traffic and its lights and businesses. I am so very heartbroken by this change. I've lived here since early childhood and have always enjoyed my backyard, but now it is no longer the same. At the wetlands meeting in the fall and tonight, I heard the developer saying that the area now looks much better than it had. 
Yet to those of us who live on Middletown Avenue, it most certainly does not. With the wooded areas cleared, I can now assume that I will no longer enjoy the delightful sightings of the wild turkeys, geese, ducks, and deer who have from time to time been seen in my backyard. I will no longer see the beautiful color foliage of the trees in that site, all things of beauty, nature, and peacefulness. I have always felt very safe in my backyard, knowing that there were woods between my yard and Silas Dean Highway, and now I feel that anyone will be able to walk into my backyard from Silas Dean. Coming to this meeting, I have questions. Where on this property will the buildings be constructed, and where will the parking lots be? And from today's meeting, since all the presentations were to the commission, we saw nothing, so I still don't have answers to those questions. Will, your, will the proposed employee daycare center have an outdoor play area, and if so, where is that to be located? Here's my wish list. I see that there's currently a chain link fence around the site. I would feel very much safer if a fence remained on the east side of this property permanently, thus preventing people from walking from property, this property onto our backyards. I presently believe that I may be happier to have the buildings di uh, built directly behind my property to block my view of Silas Dean versus the openness of a parking lot, which would give me the full view of Silas Dean. But more ideally, I would be happy to have the developer landscape the east side of his property with an abundance of very quickly growing tall trees, perhaps heavily fertilized with lots of miracle grow. Mm -hmm. We need tall trees to block out the lights, the sights, and the sounds from not only Silas Dean Highway, but from the parking lots of these medical buildings. I wish the developer well with the construction of these buildings and hope that all will go according to his plan and that he will be a good neighbor to those of us who live on Middletown Avenue. Probably the vast majority of us have lived here for decades, and we are now mourning the loss of what we had prior to the clearing of all those trees, all that property. Thank you for listening, and I truly hope that you have heard my concerns. I ask that you please do whatever can be done to alter our now urban-like feel to our properties. Please don't leave us with an open view of parking lots of these medical buildings and the Silasine Highway. And as an addendum to what I've heard tonight, after hearing today's reports, I see that I hadn't given much thought to the increased traffic on my street. Wow, as it presently is, there are times when I must wait about three minutes before I can pull out of my driveway. And if I heard the traffic report correctly today, there's an expected increase of 40% more traffic on my south side end of Middletown Avenue. I am now worried. We are being hit with three new construction projects, all pretty much at the same time. The Burger Joint on the corner of Maple and Middletown Avenue, the Borden Apartments, and now these medical buildings. Yes, I now have traffic concerns. This will bring a major change to our residential neighborhood. Not only has my backyard been affected by this proposed construction project, but now I also have concerns about my front yard as well, and this does worry me. Thank you. So, so I, I, while we were watching it, we were recognizing the fact that the public wasn't really seeing it. So would either any one of the team kind of describe verbally, perhaps with some dimensions, maybe off of, and maybe turn the plan around, and obviously not start from the beginning, but just characterize maybe distance from the property line. The driveway is 50, 50 feet in, the first building is 100 feet, whatever it is. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is again, to orientate, this is the driveway coming in from Silas State Highway, currently known as Puritan Drive. Uh, my building that I'm here, 1260 is here, which is the medical building, and the Liberty Bank is here. This is the back of the site, and you can see the dotted line at the bottom, the railroad tracks, and then the properties. Uh, I'm not sure where on the track that the one that's supposed to live, but uh, the building one, which is going to be built first, is in a very similar location to where the very end of the old Puritan building was built. It's in the same kind of orientation as the long part that was there. The Puritan building was actually back a little bit. We're going to pull it just a little forward so it's more in line with the driveways coming in. Um, so, and then building two is over here with its front facing the railroad tracks and its back facing South Sea Highway, and that's just 20,000 square foot. And then the proposed exit. Uh, to Mill Street is this way here, and the current dental property uh, is here. So as far as orientation, that's what it looks like. <coughs>
I don't want to. Can you tell I'm not brought this far? <laughs> I don't want. This is a better. Uh, I maybe I should brought this one first. So we are proposing boatloads of landscaping on the property, um, uh, all of which, at some level, between the building, all of, every one of these islands that you see in here is going to have trees in it. Um, you know, some of them. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The island trees grow to some along the main drive. Drive, yeah, about 40 feet. Yeah, so all of these trees that are along what we call the main drive, which is this drive right here, mm -hmm. all of these trees in these islands here will grow to 40 feet. The other one's about to 20. Okay, and the ones in the secondary islands grow to about 20 feet. We've also, where the railroad tracks is, which is down here again, all along the entire property line where we can, where there's enough room, this is all planting terrace trees and bushes. And, you know, just in this little area here, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trees, just in this little area right here. And again, all of these 40 feet. Um, there's less landscaping down here because of the, the, where the property line goes and where the railroad and the easement for the uh, CLMP wires that are currently out there. We're not allowed to plant near the CLMP wires over here. Wetlands. Uh, and wetlands, thank you, Kevin. Um, but as far as blockage of seeing side scene highway, the building picks that up, which is the same as what the Puritan, old Puritan building did. This same coverage is the same coverage that the Puritan building gave you. What you're not going to get is the Puritan building that went this way, this part of it, which is now you know, not there. But again, we pick it up here with 40 foot trees in this area here. Uh, you know, and then all of the trees that I said are going down here. Is that, so, another, is that another, excuse me, is that another line of trees just above that? Yes. Right here is trees. Every island on the property has at least one, and most of them have two trees along with low plants. Um, and, and I have to say that, you know, uh, being a steward of South Sea Highway and owning fine properties on South Sea Highway, we try to be the best neighbor to everybody, whether it's residential, which is this is the first time we've backed up the residential, but we took into consideration, uh, you know, what it's going to look like when it's finished. And I appreciate the thought that it looks like a Brown land now with just a flat thing, but that's needed to be done to get to a starting point so that we could put the nice stuff in. We have to pick the kind of funky stuff out. Um, so, uh, you, know, you know, you know, we got trees all over here, There's lots and lots of landscaping. So I hope that at least gives the audience that's here that's interested in my project a little better orientation of where the buildings are and what we're proposing. Where's the dumpsters going to be? Uh, one dumpster for building one is going to be right here. Okay, and the dumpster for building two is right here. Okay, again, as far away from the railroad tracks and you know the homes as possible. What what entrance would be used for service for garbage trucks for delivery purposes? What uh, right. so size thing are most would be used? We're proposing almost everything to come down here. What is known as Pier Road. I think we're gonna have to rename that now because there's no more Pier. That that's a private driveway. That's that's not a town road. You said that the parking lot wasn't going to get done right away, only a part of it we're building once. When are those trees going to come in, or is that going to be put off till like five, ten years from now when you guys decide to build building two? Nope, not at all. Good question. So the, the building two, what we're proposing is uh, there's going to be a line on the main drive here that everything to this side of the main drive, which is all of this, and all of this area back here won't be paved and won't be developed until we get a tenant for building two. But all of these islands on this side which is going to have all usable stuff at the beginning for Project One. All of these trees will be planted right off, you know, right at the beginning. So you'll get you'll get the barrier of these trees immediately. You don't have to wait until somebody decides they want to make that. Now, so is the, is the fence going in part, the tree lines where you're putting the trees in by the grass? Will there be a fence on the other side? <laughs> or is it just No, no fencing there. No fencing at all. No. Okay. So somebody can just walk I would say no different than when we came to the site of day one when there was a, right along the building there was a track that looked like it had been used for years where there was a path cut into the woods from traffic that led right to the railroad track. So I suspect that <coughs> there may have been already people that were traversing the tracks and coming through the property through the path that we, we found that so at the risk of annoying everybody who's pleasantly participating, appreciate it. 
I, I need to, no, no, keep it that forward, keep it facing forward, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm losing, exactly, and I'm, and I'm missing the, uh, the comments on the record, okay? Um, so I, I, well, I, I'm going to invite people to come on up and, and uh, you know, offer some critiques, and if, if it's appropriate, I'll have them come up and answer you right there for the whole public, all right? But I, I need introductions, and I need uh, to get it on the record. So, yeah, it's, uh, so, so, so let's go to the next public and then we'll, we'll circle back because we made a list of those questions. Jim Woodworth, I live at 33 Mill Street. <coughs> um, and I am, one, one of my hats is president of the board. Um, and obviously traffic implications happen here. But to step back, uh, <coughs> I coincidentally happened to be at the, uh, Inland Wetlands meeting 15 years ago or whenever when uh, you guys were doing 1260 over and the guy from Puritan said, don't put any big trees that's going to block the view of our place. <laughs> and that place was a dump. <laughs> then, literally a dump, all, that, all, the, all the trash in the brook. And you guys are going to do a heck of a job on that. I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is a floodplain, though, so the more you can do with that impervious surface, and I see all those wonderful traffic islands, uh, when you go over to uh, Buckland Mall, in front of L.L. Bean, you see the traffic island with the, with the uh, water inverted. inverted coming in. So there's, I don't know how many square feet or how many gallons of water you could, you could take in there, and, and lots of, should be lots of other things. Great. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that the water draining off Draining onto the landing on the roof is not draining off solar panels, but that's for another day, I guess. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, so bioretention basins, as you suggested, I really I, I appreciate you guys bringing all that up. That's great, and uh, keep it up. Um, and thank God for the railroad with the stop sign. Oh my God, we can get out of our driveway now. And uh, w there was a lot of talk about the sight line at the railroad. Well, that happens with the traffic, too, when they, they come up there. But, and, and, and as they said, the sidewalk ends at the railroad tracks. So now we're going to have however many more people from the apartment building and from the, the uh, walk into the doctor's office. That's a great, what a great opportunity. I used to walk through there drive occasionally through that with my uh, four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive vehicle. But so the, the sidewalk still ends at the railroad tracks. We have people in, in we have at least one person in a, in a uh, uh, motorized wheelchair, and it, they have to go on the road. So I, I don't expect you guys to do that, but the leadership of the town should be doing something about that as it happens here. Jim, should, uh, I've been thinking about this. Should we tell Danny Camilleri to get the MDC to extend the sidewalk? You know. The payment, wait a minute. With the payment they're giving the town because of the <laughs> and the repaving of Mill Street. Well, you know, I spoke to them about that. They aren't responsible for doing anything but re replacing what they, they dug up. Into that paving job. I know, I know. And, but from the, from it, and by all means, you know, let's try everything we can find. But, but we're also getting incredible tax development from all those buildings. The first dollars that come in from there should go into that sidewalk. That, that is really serious. Uh, we had, we, I'm also on the, uh, uh, bike walk committee with George and others, and uh, it's it's way it's overdue now. People, you have to walk in the street. Fortunately, there's only 100 feet before the stop sign in either direction, so it's not as bad as it was before the railroad came along uh, or got back into operation. But that's really uh, really something for starters. And then there's those 75 year old gaps in the sidewalk. Uh, a lot of kids on that street. And 60 more cars per hour on Middletown Avenue? Holy cow. Um, we got to, you know, it's all, on, it's all on you guys. Somebody here has got to take care of that. Uh, but, but uh, you know, and it is a floodplain, so the more, the more you can, more infiltration you can encourage there. 
that was part of the conversation that many years ago, pervious parking area, even though you pulled it back from the from the brook, which was good too. Um, but that's uh, fantastic. Anyway, thanks. What, whatever you can do with those sidewalks, that'd be great. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Woodward. I live at 456 Middletown Avenue. I've lived there for 41 years. And 456 is on the east side of Middletown Avenue, so I do not back onto this property. And I am not, like Christine, I am not here to oppose. I think the taking down of the Puritan building and the building of these two buildings will be a good addition to our tax rate, but I do have some concerns. Number one concern is the traffic flow at the points of egress and entering. And I hope and pray that somebody is going to stay in touch with that. I can now see, I don't think I, from the looks of this, I won't be able to forever, but from my front porch, I can look over and see the road that goes out to Silas Dean. And even now I see taillights stopped over there. And this sounds like it's gonna put a lot of traffic out there trying to go left or right. I realize another traffic light out there is not gonna, is gonna be a pain in the neck, but somebody's got to stay in touch with what's really going to happen down the line, not on just now, but after these buildings are constructed and in use. What's gonna happen going out on Silas Dean? What's gonna happen going out on Mill Street? I was on Mill Street about midday today. It was very quiet, but that's not always the case with Mill Street, and we're gonna add all the traffic from the Borden Building's gonna have access out there, and uh, the traffic here. Please don't abandon us, and thank you for your sensitivity to traffic on Middletown Avenue. We appreciate that. We don't need, uh, there are some days like Christine, I sit there and say, okay, what's coming from Rocky Hill and what's coming down from Mill Street before I get out of my driveway? I wanna pick up something that Jim said that occurred to me after uh, my opposition to 24 Maple Street, but also in looking at the Borden building, the building on the corner that's been refurbished, and this building. Do we not, as a town, encourage, require, urge, ask about solar panels or other items that might help the town become more green. The young woman from Sweden is right. Our president is wrong. Our young woman from Sweden is right. Our environment is in danger. It seems like we've had a wealth of opportunity to bring people in here in the beginning phases and say, what can you add? to those buildings. I just want you to think of them, maybe it's not your job, maybe it's economic development, maybe it's town council, but I think it's time the town began to think about that. And I agree with my neighbor, Christine, anything you can do for the houses and the neighbors along the west side of Middletown Avenue uh, and consider what, what they might need for uh, protection in terms of growth and things. I'm sure they would appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Jim Gothers, and I'm at 33 Mill Street. I also serve on the board with Jim. Um, and uh, I would just like to uh, reiterate about the uh, sidewalks and the need for it. I live in the... Uh, southeast side of of the condo building and i can see people running that stop sign on a daily basis you know they don't stop for the railroad track because they got used to not stopping there are some people that stop there are some people that stop in the middle and there are some people that actually race the train believe it or not I, the train came through again tonight he really comes through slow in the dark out of fear of somebody trying to race them across the railroad track. So that's one thing I want to say, and, and I'm just curious about that mountain <laughs> out there that's where building two is going in, or phase two, of crushed concrete. <laughs> that, that's gotta be a million square yards of something. Huh? I'm just curious as to where it's gonna go. Underneath the parking lot. Okay. That's reclaimed the building. Thank you. I, I also was one of the people that spoke earlier, so about that tree line. Yes. For Thank the you record. Very, Thank you very much, sir.
Anybody else? Well, while you're thinking about it. Oh, we, a gentleman just stood up. Alan Kelly Urso, 425 Middletown Avenue, Winnie Trees. <clears throat> Other than that, go for it. Thank you, sir. Oh. <coughs> if we don't get trees, we're going to come back to the assessor's office and get our taxes lowered for the value of our properties. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that I heard uh, initially that I don't think has been answered yet is can you describe the the play area, outdoor area, because I think there is one, right? It's a detention. To, to them. I might as well answer it to them. I think we can probably figure it out. First you want, of all, I just want to say. You want to turn it around? Tell, turn it around I, I think we probably know where it is. Sorry. Or you can put it over there and yeah. everybody will see it at the same time. Um, before I comment on the play area, I just want to say that um, for the first time, in my 20 year career, I think I swung and missed. I didn't realize that um, when we talked about putting this property in, I immediately went to this neighbor, uh, the dental lab, and talked to the gentleman in Florida. I also went over to the husband and wife that owned the printing press over here. Uh, and I apologize, I swung and missed. I should have probably came and walked the street over here and knocked on doors to let everybody know what was going on. And I sincerely apologize for that. I also apologize for the fact that right now, it looks like the frozen tundra and it's just a big flat piece of uh, and, the mountain. and the mountain and the mountain <laughs> just so everybody knows it, to be environmentally right that mountain is all of the crushed concrete from the Puritan building including the foundation the piers the actual building everything that was made of concrete was crushed and left on site so that I didn't have to truck it off site and put it somewhere else and then pay to bring process back in to put it under underneath the blacktop and the building. So all of that is gonna be reused. That's just stored for right now. And, um, so I, I, and I do agree that it doesn't look pretty now, but eventually that will be spread out underneath the blacktop and used as process, and that's why it's there. There's also, down this end, there's a couple of piles of dirt. That's the topsoil that we stripped and saved that'll also be reused in all of the grass area and the islands. Um, but I do want to apologize, maybe in hindsight, when we put the construction fence up, maybe we should have screened it a little better so that during the construction, and maybe we'll still do it, um, you know, we can put something on the fence so that you don't see through the fence, you know, while we're doing the construction. And, and again, I sincerely apologize to the neighborhood for that. Uh, with regards to the play area, <clears throat> the play area is, is going to be in the back of building one over here, on this end over here, uh, and that's where uh, the, you know, the, the kids will be. And, just to reiterate what was said before, the daycare is not going to be a daycare for profit. It's only going to be a daycare <clears throat> run by Starling for Starling employees at both this building and the 1260 building. So we're not going to be having outside people dropping their kids off. It's strictly in-house. Uh, and I want to be very specific about that because it, it's a daycare in the sense that it's going to act like a daycare, but it's not for profit where anybody in the room could bring their kids, uh, so to say. Could, could you explain? Uh, what it is sized for, how many young people? I'll let Charlie speak to the, to the size of the daycare and the amount of kids. Good evening, Charlie Nyberg. I had mentioned during my presentation that there's two classrooms for uh, preschool of 20 each, so 40. And then there are two, one infant, toddler, one infant room for eight and a toddler room for eight, so a total of 56 children. Is that intended for both this building and the one in the front? Yes, yes. 1260. And again, for the gentleman with the trees. Hold it, but not for your other property there. Not the 12. Only for Starling employees that are at the 1210 and the 1260. Just Starling. Just Starling only. No, no bank children. Yeah, nobody from yeah. the bank. No nobody bank. from the other tenants at 1260, only, only Starling. And just one other thing on the trees. And, you're happy to come up and look at the plan, but to give you an idea, there, those, those 40 foot trees, there's two here, two here, two here, two here, two here, two, 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 two. Every one of these islands has two trees that are gonna be planted in it. And on this side, when we do phase two, all of these, uh, even this on the corner of the building, all of these have two. Back here, I'll just read it off really quickly. There's four trees in this clump, 
There are one, two, three, four, five, six more trees here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trees here. And one, two, three, four more trees here. There's also trees in these uh, little parking lot islands. We put trees there as well. Uh, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trees in this line here. If, I don't think that there's another square inch that we could put a tree on the property. Be when they're planted, so how tall are they? And they 40 grow foot, to 40. 40 foot on the ones that are in the dry aisle in this area. Yeah, but wait a minute. That's what they will be. They mm -hmm. planted at 40, 40 foot when they planted. No, no, we don't plant 40 foot trees. No, I know. <laughs> I'm asking. <laughs> you want to speak to Let him thing? answer. <laughs> I'll let the expert tell you how big they are. With a 20 foot. Or how quick they'll get. How big. For, for the record, Kevin Johnson. Um, the, the 40 foot trees, I think I've got them specced at like a three, three and a half inch caliper. Um, you're, you're probably going to get a tree in the 12 to 14 foot range, maybe 15 feet at time of planting. Um, the plums, they're going to be considerably smaller. They're probably going to be more in the six to eight foot range. Because again, it's the plums that mature out at 20 feet, give or take. Could you uh, describe how many parking spaces are proposed in phase one and how many are left for phase two? Is there a definition on that number? Mm -hmm. There is? Somewhere in the plans? I don't want to hold it up. If Peter seems to think it's in the plans, all I got to do is look a little harder. Is there anybody else who has questions for the applicant? So the, so the breakdown is 520 for phase one and, and 95 additional for the phase two. Yes, this plan is in the package, shows. It's shown to the audience. But phase two, there's a dotted line on this plan, mark seven of 18. Yep. That shows the phase two line. So it's this area kind of in the sun, page 7, 18 in the information package um, that shows the area that we're going to do as part of this. Thank you. So where I'm heading with the question is if the ratio of 600 to the 80,000 is already high, that ratio is even sky higher than that for a phase one ratio. That's... So you, you are requesting our consideration of this expanded ratio of parking, right, for the whole site. And it's, what is, what's required as a minimum? 480. 480. Four, 480, and you're asking us to consider 620. 610. 610. 610. Of which 36 will be under here. And so with the phase one gets 520. I, in other words, I, the ratio is very high. I, I don't remember the exact number in phase two. I want to say it's in the 90s, yes, yeah, 90 closer 90 to 100. Points. Yep. So that would be 500, give or take, 510 for phase right. one. So I guess what I'm getting at is the ratio in phase one is even higher than it is for the whole site because you're you're doing most of. Well, yeah, because we have to develop this in order to get an in and out drive. We have to do those parts. Any any chance you'd be open to the idea of doing less parking in the first phase? You know. I, I guess there's a little part of me that thinks maybe phase two doesn't happen. So in the interim, why bother building it, right? Especially if it's an issue with coverage. Well, I mean, in, in going down that thought process that you brought up, when we did the same thing, the area where we come down from here, uh, building one, the primary parking will be you know, around the building, and that encompasses this kind of area right here, which is why we draw the line over here. Absolutely. And plus we need this area for the main drive just to get in and out of the property. Yes. So we we're kind of we have to build this. We kind of have to build this. This is the main drive going out. Yep. Yeah, I think I think it's the north quadrant right there where your fingers were that here. north quadrant. Mm -hmm. You know, people are gonna walk a very long way if it's really even needed and it's you know so I guess that's all I'm getting at is yeah. maybe there's a difference in the phase two line of construction that could be considered. You know, 
in the well, interim. And if, and if you're really using all the parking, then, you know, then it makes more rationale for when, you know, when there's a phase two going on, that's all. Okay. Just, just a thought that I had and, you know, we can talk. Yeah. I would want to see the trees planted in phase one <laughs> as well because then by the time phase two happens, then there's that's a fair point, too. All, hey, of the, all of the landscaping, except what's in obviously the islands that we're not going to do, is part of phase two. But all of these trees out here and all of the stuff mm -hmm. that's Gordon's Beach, uh, Middletown Avenue, and the road tracks is part of phase one. And that's, I was thinking, with his the paving plan, I see exactly, you know. The, egress and the two roads but his snow areas are affected by if he doesn't pave that area then it to the north then it messes up his snow stacking and all that on both spots and then also it lets him if he didn't pave that section to the north as you were kind of talking out loud it messes up the snow stacking and then also those those last green spaces those parking islands right and so it's it kind of hurts us it hurts the neighbors more than anything yeah I mean, we really wanted to again right establish the, the whole border between us the railroad tracks and the neighbors and making sure all this gets planted along with all of these islands as part of phase one right the islands i see are a really critical part of that really make it work Absolutely. nice yeah. and also i can see you can see how it's island right out with a roadway to come from like puritan drive to like mill street let's say how it's dotted because your building lines just to the west of those so I see Two issues I, I want the uh, developer to consider from the uh, engineer's plan. I want to be sure we say it this way. Uh, it says on uh, item F on the site plan comments, consider the addition of bike parking facilities for both buildings. I want that emphatic. Not just consider it, do it. Okay. Well, that's what their response says. Necessary. And then another one here is, uh, and this is from the Bike and Walking Committee that I chair and the new guys and will be reporting to you on this. Probably one of the things we want. And uh, that's why Peter mentions these things whenever we, he reviews these matters. And the town engineer, yeah, they're both on there. And then uh, the other one is way over here, it says including street trees or some other landscaping treatment along the Silas Dean Highway access straight to the site. It says consider, I want them here. So put okay, that well, in as a condition maybe if necessary. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speak first about the Silas Dean Highway plantings that um, the town planner had mentioned in his. That area is currently not on the map, but it's the area on Kirby Drive, which we're gonna rename that town. Uh, Drive, which comes on this way, which has a strip of land that is owned by the 1260 property. Um, on that land currently, there are uh, four telephone poles that are currently in that strip of land. With and they can come out because you're going under? Well, actually, over here. actually not. Those uh, light poles are paid for by the 1260 property, and they're strictly for street lighting. That provides the street lighting for, oh. for Puritan Drive. Um, and that's on a separate metered service. It's not connected to the electric at 1260 or going to be connected to the electric at 1210. Those were uh, those were there when, when we purchased the uh, 1260 building 18 years ago um, and are maintained by the utility and uh, I and 1260. We pay a flat fee to have those there. It's a light purity road. So uh, those uh, unfortunately can't come down. And with the wires there, uh, I don't think the trees, that's gonna be a good area to put trees. Also, as somebody mentioned, I think from the public, that was the area where Mr. Singer, who previously owned the property, said he didn't want anything because it was gonna block the view of his building uh, from the uh, South State Highway. And I, I suspect that <coughs> now, it, although I didn't agree with it then, maybe I agree with it now where I piggyback on him where, you know, I don't wanna create any sight lines either because this is what I call a flag lot where we don't have any front of up front. So, you know, all of the trees that we're planting back here to protect the neighbors, you know, up here where the wetlands are and everything where we can't plant trees, everything is lower. So, you know, 
I think it's a barren way in and out, so that's why I favor it. But I hear what you're saying. I agree with that with the town engineer. It's one of his conditions. Yeah, no, and I understand. And, uh, I, I winced a little bit when, uh, when Kevin said that we were 100% with the comments. That was, I think, the only one that we had some uh, feedback. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to the commission. Uh, so, so we have to act on the hearing in some manner, right, the, the public hearing part of this. Um, while I'm, I'm struggling with specific items that we haven't asked for and received yet, um, we do have comments that have just come in today, staff comment responses to staff comments that just came in today. Uh, there were some comments from the public that um, the applicant may want to think over. Think over. Um, and in the interest of time, we do have a couple other applicants to, to try and hear tonight. I guess I'm thinking that, you know, sh should we be extending the, the permit? I think it might be hearing? a good idea, Mr. Chairman, for the reasons you cited. I mean, other, otherwise, you know, if, we, if everybody thinks we're going to get there, we just plow through it. But there are a couple of things. There are some calculations that are required. Well, I, uh, I, I guess, you know, my thought is that... Uh, I, I like this, and I, I think it's, you know, it's something that that ultimately we will approve. It's just my sense from Derek is that he needs, you know, both for for his well-being and for the town's well-being with respect to MS4 to get a better understanding or at least a justification that he can use to explain, you know, the increase in impervious coverage and you know, whether there are any kind of low impact design alternatives that, that could be considered or, or, or if not, why not sorts of things that, you know, that may or may not change what we have here tonight. But I don't frankly feel that it's something that we could kind of stipulate away as, you know, redesign the site to the satisfaction of town staff and, and feel like we've, you know, actually taken any kind of meaningful action. So I'd, you know, I'd want to give him till the next meeting to basically work out with them, <coughs> the, you know, the calculations and the explanations and whether there are things that can be done to, you know, cover the issues that, you know, Commissioner Dean raised and, and so forth. And, you know, maybe just make sure that everybody's on the same page with respect to the eight or ten pages of comments and responses. Mm. I mean, that, that's just my feeling. I mean, I, yeah. I, I feel a lot better about the whole thing than I did coming in, mm. um, you know, in terms of elevations and lights and screening and, you know, the, the traffic sounds like a large number when you're talking about the whole day, but you break it down into minutes, it's you know, probably not even noticeable, you know, particularly on the Middletown Avenue side, um, you know, and I, so I, I feel pretty good about it. It's just I want to make sure that, um, you know, Derek gets the answers to the questions that he needs so that the town, you know, doesn't end up getting jammed up by deep for having done this without doing our due diligence. What is, what is the timeline with respect to going before DOT? Well, it's my understanding that the DOT will not uh, entertain any conversations until we get the approval of the town. So we're prepared to okay. immediately proceed. Mm -hmm. They will never preliminarily yeah. talk to you at no. all? <laughs> you <can't laughs> the door? I hear this all the time. They, they can walk through the front they, door. But they won't talk. <coughs> they will talk. We can, uh, we they can will talk. We can submit to OSTA for administrative review at this point. Uh, yeah. They just can't act. Correct. They, they right. right. Yeah. Until yeah, so, so usually with these big applications, we're, we're usually looking for the initial feedback, right? Um, I, I don't doubt that what you're saying is true. They are not going to ask you to put in a light at, you know, at Silas Dean, but uh, they are the traffic experts. They'll comment. They'll ask you to do things, and just some feeling from them. You know, the fact that you've gone before them and you can report back, we went, we had a first conversation, that'll make us feel better, at least some of us better. <laughs> okay. So try and set that up before you come back. Understood. I agree with Rich. I, I think that some of these things are something we just can't pass off to staff. We, we've got to take, get a handle on 
some of our is there something self I, I, di I don't disagree whatsoever. Are there specific things that anybody wants to throw out right now that they should be thinking about besides the comments they've heard so far? Anybody battling to throw something at them? Motion to continue the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, any any comments? And I, all just, those I want to compliment close Jensen and Miller for the 7580 answers they gave on today's memo. And a lot of data <laughs> just in this one. That's what Rich is referencing. You read them all? There's at least, yeah, there's at least 70 or 80 anyway on it. And you were paying attention to everything else then. But I think that's, I agree with Rich. I think that's very helpful. Continue this. I have to support staff. Oh, that's good. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. So, yeah, you want to take a. Okay, we'll take uh, five minutes because they're going to set up a laptop for the next one. For those of you who are staying, you'll be able to see this one a little easier, I think. You know, there's a couple of those lights. They fill it now. It's 11 o'clock. They put it on 6. It's 
over to the end, right at the end. He said this, he was only here for that. Alright, so we're going to go We could just we could make it work. We can make it work. Yeah, we can make it work. I control it on here. Yeah, it will advance. I need popcorn. I feel like I need some popcorn. Like we're going, we're going to watch a movie. All right. All right. Tell them they have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you for that five minute break. Let's get started. Uh, oh, actually, I suppose we should introduce this. Would you be so kind as to introduce oh. what we're doing? We are on item number two, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, application 2031-19-Z, J.P. Morgan Chase Comp uh, Bank, seeking a special permit for a bank with a drive-up ATM at 1151 South Street. 
introduce yourself and the project. Great, yes. Good evening, Commission members. My name is Jennifer Porter. I'm the attorney for the applicant, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. We're here tonight in connection with our proposed development of the property located at 1151 Silas Dean Highway. It's at the intersection of Silas Dean and Mill Road. Um, the property was formerly improved with a restaurant. Um, the, it was called the Tilted Killed Pub, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, which has been vacant for some period of time. Um, our intention is to demolish the existing building and um, build an approximately 3,400 square foot bank, 3,470 square foot bank, um, which will be detailed in our engineering testimony. Um, just by brief way of background, Chase Bank will be ground leasing the property from the existing property owner, which is 1151 Silas Dean LLC. Um, so we will not be taking ownership of the property. We are entering into a long-term ground lease, and that ground lease um, has certain rights associated with it. Um, there are mutual access rights between our parcel, which is parcel C, and some of the board members may um, remember that um, the property owner came before the commission uh, last year for a lot line adjustment, um, breaking the property into three separate parcels. Our development is on parcel C, and um, as part of our ground lease, we will have mutual access rights with respect to parcels A and B. However, we will not have um, parking rights in connection with those other properties. We will have exclusive parking rights um, only within the confines of our leased demised area, which includes parcel C, um, which you'll see as part of our site plan application. But I wanted to address you that. Have parking rights on the other property? No. But no, no. Okay. No, we have exclusive rights yes, on parcel C, um, and we do not have parking rights on the on the two remaining parcels, which ties into our request with in connection with the number of parking spaces we're proposing um, to allow for you know adequate site operations um, for for our proposed bank use. Um, so just briefly to address zoning, we're located in the regional commercial zoning district. Our um, proposed bank with a drive-through is a conditional use, which is subject to the issuance of a special permit by this board, by the commission rather. Um, in terms of our application, we will um, go into further detail about the fact that um, it's somewhat unique in that our drive-through is remote um, and is not attached directly to the building, and we'll explain that as, as part of our engineering testimony as to why that works very, very well um, in terms of the overall flow of the site and our operations. We have three individuals testifying on behalf of Chase tonight. We have our site engineer, Zachary Chaplin, from Stonefield Engineering. We have our traffic engineer, Andrew Villari, from Stonefield Engineering. And then we have our architect um, from TPG Architecture, um, Mehmet Kara. We also have a representative from Chase, our VP of Construction, uh, rather VP of Real Estate um, and Construction, Richard Dordis, um, who's also here to answer any questions that you may have regarding operations that are not otherwise addressed in our engineering and traffic and architectural testimony. So unless that, the board has any specific questions for me, um, we will begin with our engineering testimony. Thank you. Good evening, uh, <clears throat> Chairman, members. For the record, Zachary Chaplin from Stonefield Engineering, uh, civil engineer for the project. So just to give you a little bit of background, this site is located at the southwest corner of Mill Street and Silas Dean Highway. Um, generally, it's in, within a well-commercialized area. Our site itself, um, there's the church next to us, as well as the medical office building. <laughs> and then surrounding that, there's really larger commercial shopping centers to the north, east, and south. Um, under existing conditions, as Ms. Porter mentioned, it was the Tilted Kilt restaurant, which has been vacant for some time. Uh, that building itself was about 6,200 square feet. And under the proposed condition, we would look to remove that completely and build the Chase Bank. So with that said, I'm just going to turn to <clears throat> a colorized rendering of the site plan. So this is essentially the site plan that was submitted um, to the commission and all it is is colorized uh, for the viewing benefit, and it also includes our proposed landscaping. <clears throat> so a little bit of history on the project. Um, the site was recently subdivided, so we are, um, we do have parcel C is that piece in the corner, and that piece is roughly 30,576 square feet. Uh, we do not have the rights to parking um, along the parcels to the south and the west. 
However, there is an access easement, of course, that will remain in place between all the parcels. When we looked at laying out this site, you know, one of the things we wanted to look at was how do we improve the existing condition? Uh, the existing restaurant was kind of tucked into the corner. There really wasn't much landscaping. So really what we did was we said, okay, the first step as a site engineer is, you know, we try to get the access as far away from the intersection. In our case, these were existing curb cuts um, that we're looking to maintain and keep. So we're not proposing any new access. We're not changing it. We're keeping the two access points as they were. And then since there's that kind of cross access between the lots, um, you know, with the buildings to the, to the south and the west, really it made sense to kind of put the building kind of where the existing restaurant was at the northern corner. As you may know as well, there's, about, there's somewhat of a topography change, about six feet, I would say, from, from Mill Street ultimately to where the building is, uh, or at least the finished floor of the building. If you're driving down the road, you probably see how the restaurant is kind of sunken in a little bit. So all, we are also dealing with a little bit of a topo topography change that we worked into as part of this site plan. With that said, as you can kind of see from the rendering, we really wanted to take the opportunity to enhance the landscaping, specifically the perimeter and the corner by adding in you know, a bunch of deciduous trees. You know, there's landscape islands. There's even probably what I would say, you know, a larger area in front of the bank on the west side uh, where we had the opportunity to really, to really landscape that area and really beautify this corner. Um, just in terms of the, the actual layout of the site, so the main entrance is on the south side and that's where you have, you know, a typical row of parking. Uh, what we did was, as Ms. Porter mentioned before, we do have a detached drive-through ATM. And the reason for that, again, is when we laid out this site, we really want to separate the traffic for the ATM and the customers who are going inside of the bank. So what we did was we put the, the ATM in the back of the site, and what that allowed us to do is really develop a queue, but also have a bypass lane that really is separate from the main entry and from you know, sort of the other parts of the shopping center to the south. So the fact that we separate it, we're kind of helping the traffic flow um, you know, from the main customers to the ATM customers. Uh, other than that, it's, it's a fairly typical layout uh, for a bank, you know, with parking along the front and the side. And then, of course, you know, we're tying in access to the, uh, to the neighboring properties. <clears throat> we do have 26 parking spaces. Um, that, is the that is the existing condition as well, so we're maintaining that parking requirement, or maintaining that parking uh, number as well as meeting the requirement. Um, <clears throat> in terms of just some of the other improvements we're doing, we're going to be installing brand new LED lighting. Uh, you know, one of the things that's important to Chase Bank is security lighting, specifically with a drive-through ATM. So there will be brand new LED lighting. They'll be downlit, uh, but will be uh, sufficient enough to support um, you know the bank's needs. Uh, and then just to touch base a little bit on you know the special permit um, that we do require. You know, we do understand that because it's a special permit, there are certain things that we're, we were looking at when we designed it, things like suitable location, which I kind of talked about before, um, you know, neighborhood compatibility with, you know, kind of the similar commercial establishments nearby, uh, suitable access and parking, which I think the way the plan is designed is, is pretty safe and effective uh, for this use and is able to tie into the existing conditions. Uh, and finally, just the overall circulation by putting the ATM in the rear and separating it we have the ability to have a nice queue of cars to the ATM without really blocking anybody in the front, you know, or other parts of the uh, of the shopping center. Uh, a couple of things we did receive uh, a couple memos from the engineering division and the planner. I just do want to say on the record that you know we are willing to comply with all those comments. I actually just spoke to the engineer and we had a very good conversation about his letter and making sure that you know we meet what he's looking for. Um, I do want to point out a couple things that came up, some of which came up in both memos, just for the record. So uh, the light pole, uh, there is a light pole proposed at the southwest corner of our lot. It's in a striped island. And I think there was just some, some concern about vehicles potentially hitting that light pole. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's very important that we, we light this property um, well enough to support the bank and for security. By not having a light pole in that area, uh, the foot candles would go down to under one foot candle, which uh, it would actually not meet the, the town requirement as well as Chase standards. So just for, you know, for your knowledge, these light poles would be on a three foot uh, concrete foundation base. Uh, so if anybody were to hit it, it's really more of an impact to the car than anything else. 
Um, so, you know, we do feel that it is important that we have this light pole in this location, but wanted to just point this out because it was in both the planner's memo as well as the, the engineering division letter. A couple other things, just uh, soil erosion. We had a construction entrance off of Mill Street. Uh, we will relocate that so that both access points are clear during construction. What we'll do is the construction entrance will just be within our limit of disturbance and there will be circulation and people will be able to use both driveways during construction. Uh, of course, you know, with the exception of when we would potentially mill and overlay those driveways temporarily. Uh, there was a question about the dumpster. Uh, Chase is not proposing a, a dumpster on this site. Um, typically for, for the trash pickup, it's very minimal for a use like this. So, you know, they can really just roll it out and, and get it picked up. And it's actually just much cleaner and more efficient than having the enclosure on this site. Um, and again, just, just to sum up, I think from a, from a site engineer standpoint, we really look to just try to kind of keep the existing conditions, you know, as much as we can, but also improve it with the amount of landscaping we're putting in, and then also providing a very safe and efficient layout for both people who are coming to the bank and parking, as well as the customers using the ATM drive through So we think this is a really substantial upgrade to the, the corner at this intersection as compared to the existing, uh, existing condition with the restaurant. Um, and I do also want to point out, I'm going to refer to one more slide. Uh, there is a reduction in impervious. I know that was a big talking point on the last application. So for the benefit of the board, we've actually prepared an exhibit where the areas in green, you can kind of see our, our, our new green pervious areas and the red are our new impervious areas. But overall, there's a reduction of, I think, of about 1,200 square feet of impervious surfaces, which of course is just a great benefit um, of this project. You, you did that while you were sitting in the yeah, audience and hearing say, us I was going to say, were you like creating this? Uh, yes, but it is, as it came up, I was just glad it was prepared. But. 100 foot high trees. <laughs> and, uh, and with that, I'll take, I'll take any questions. George? Yeah, a couple of them. Um, I don't know if they, my hearing aid went off, one of them tonight, so bear with me. I can hear you most of the time. Uh, let, what, let's discuss the George, uh, George. comment, I think, by the George. engineer. George, uh, speak into the microphone. Speak into the microphone. Oh, oh good. Yeah. Jeff can't get him close. <laughs> like the town manager <laughs> one more time. Yeah, uh, and uh, let's discuss the uh, vehicle queue length anticipated for the drive through lane. I don't know what he really means uh, by that, but uh, I, I mean, you can get backed up in there before you get to the bypass, I guess. And, but I don't know. Yeah, our traffic engineer is here tonight who has more, we just worked on so many banks that we actually have like a lot of studies regarding a queue, but to give you the short summary, it's typically only one car that we would expect at the ATM. And we have room for, I want to say yeah. more than four or five plus the bypass. Bring it. I don't think you have to bring the bypass line further back or anything. No, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I would agree. That's what you mean. I think it should be all right. It looks like five or six before you get out to the main right away, right? Yes. Okay. Um, George, can I ask? Yeah. The, the drive up is only for the ATM, right? It's not the window with the tubes and all that kind of stuff. That is correct. This is just a standalone ATM. Yeah, I mean, and, and I go to America's Most Convenient Bank, and they have a different lane for that drive up ATM, and sometimes there are four people because you know, somebody's refinancing their house at the ATM or something, <laughs> but, you know, I've never seen it more than four or five, Depends even on, on Saturday, Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. That doesn't yeah. happen too often. I think we used to worry about it in the past before we understood these things. Uh, the other questions I have are uh, questions of what you got. Uh, what's the, the bulletproof glass for the tellers? That's well, kind of a new one. I haven't seen that in too many banks. That's a that's good though, I'd say. Not yeah. that we expect any problems in town, but you know, I think it's just for safety. Uh, and then the uh, assisted I can use that. Oh, assisted telehearing. I'm at another bank and I asked them what they I told them I was coming here tonight for you guys. And uh, uh, you know, I said, What's assisted telehearing? They said it's probably got to do with the ATMs. Is that correct? It's it's with the the tellers, so I think it's just uh, it is, it yeah. Is the tellers. It's with the tellers. Oh, oh, okay, that would be good. I'd appreciate that. Um, I think 
think I may have one other at the gym, and I'll get there after. I just have a quick question on the bypass lane. Um, are we allowing them to turn left or right out of there? Because it's like right now, it's it's striped or it's the you know the the symbol there is that anybody can go straight and just leave. So are we allowing them to potentially cross over the traffic who wants to take a right and go onto Mill Street, who just finished at the ATM? I'm just I'm curious about the traffic operations at that, which could potentially cause some maybe some conflicts or at least some confusion. Yeah, and this came up at the... Is that, is that the, a common thing right there that I'm seeing? That no, it's, it's a good question. It came up at our design review committee meeting last week, and, and our, our traffic engineer has some more data to, to support uh, or explain it. But I, you know, I will say that, generally speaking, it's, you know, the intersection there wouldn't be so much of a safety concern as more as people who are using the ATM just have to wait. You know, if there is some sort of backup or buildup, it's just a matter of waiting and, and eventually the traffic will move, but we don't see it as a necessarily like a conflict of a, of a safety measure. I'm just assuming that the person using the bypass is not a very happy person. So they're maybe a bit more aggressive than somebody who just finished their ATM experience and is leaving and wants to take a ride on the Mill Street. So I'm just wondering if there's ever any traffic experience with that it's just it's, you're at such a low speed that it's just one of those things where it could be it could be like a small in, in awkward the moment lane, you're, at the, you're at a low speed i'm sure you're at it's just one of those awkward moments between it's, a, it's, it's probably more of a question for the, the yep. traffic yeah one a couple questions and it, it's simple stuff but uh, important to me hmm. uh i've used that site a lot over the years and not that i went to tilt kill for that much, but uh, uh oh, seriously the Catch basin on that west side is right smack in the middle of the driveway and it's down about that far. I actually went in there a second day and looked in at it today and it's not that bad, but they should raise it a little bit so that the drainage gets into it, but that it's not like a hole in the ground that your tire or a car drops into when you're going out that driveway. And uh, then there was, oh yeah, and even and then while I was in there the second time, I noticed that front one is it down a bit. And if they raise that a couple of inches, that would be uh, much better. I'm sure they will when the pavers get in there. They'll they'll tend to that kind of stuff. But I want to be sure it's done. especially yeah. that west side. Yeah, part of part of the it's really like a yeah. hole in the middle of the driveway where your tire is going. You don't want people experiencing that. The people going through the drive-through will <coughs> encounter it. I don't think, but others do. No, it's a, it's a fair point, and, and part of the project is, you know, we're regrading some areas, we're going to mill and overlay others, and when the pavers go out there, we'll, we'll try to fix and improve those conditions. So um, I'm going through the comments that the town engineer and the town planner provided, and just looking for um, a little more depth on some of them uh, and, and issues resolving. Landscape calculations, waivers potentially needed. Um, I do have that with me tonight. Um, just to quickly summarize it, uh, one of them is a 25% requirement to have landscaping on your on your lot, uh, where we have 27.6%, so we meet that. Um, there is a landscaping strip requirement uh, for the street line as well as the side yards. We meet it for both street lines. However, at the side yard, it's kind of, I don't know if it's considered existing nonconformity is we really don't have the opportunity to um, to put it on, on the sides because side we're connecting, you know, into the existing pavement. So I guess it could be a waiver um, or an existing nonconformity. And then the next one was uh, the amount of trees required. Oh, the amount of trees required per your frontage, uh, which we have, I think it's 338 linear feet of frontage, which equates to seven trees. There is one existing tree at the corner that we're looking to preserve. It's a fairly large, substantial tree, if, you, if you're familiar with it. And then we're going to be putting in three trees uh, along Mill Street. And then really, the remainder, there's just utility conflicts and things like that, specifically at the exactly at the corner. So that, I guess, technically would be a waiver where we would be short three trees per the requirement. But of course, it's an improvement on the existing condition. Uh, and then lastly, there's a requirement that just says landscape the islands wherever possible. Uh, and I, I do think we would comply with that. 
There's also there's also some calculation on islands, right? Five, yeah. Right, which that would must be a waiver too, right? Yeah, one more, Mr. Chairman. Whenever we can want to. So, um, landscape islands. We're, and where I'm struggling here is that you know, sometimes you can just you know put things on staff, but if we're not really knowing what we're giving a waiver for, no, specifically. I understood. Um, <laughs> is there anything in uh, the town engineers uh, traffic a traffic impact impact statement, which is I don't think a difficult thing to leave to staff, quite frankly. Other questions for the applicant? Yeah, just one more. Um, and I think Joe Hickey might have mentioned this to me. But do you can you put more plantings out front on the site of steam a little bit? Or it seemed to be a little sparse, he thought, at design review. But I, and I look at it, and I'm not sure he's probably not right. Another thing he said, do you need <coughs> the town staff would have to tell me this. Um, the bank on the Mill Street side, he thought a stone wall might be needed there because it might be pre it's pretty steep there. But with the bypass drive, and you're not doing that, I don't know. So, it, yeah, you want to. So the slope coming down to the to the it, bypass area. Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's it, no problem. Well, it's very similar to what what's happening today. So you know, we are we are increasing. You know, with the by, with the bypass lane, it's like a slight uh, adjustment, but you have to remember that we're also decreasing the building size almost by half. So it really we're not encroaching too much into that area where the slope isn't too bad, where we don't need a wall. Okay. See, I don't know how far back this building is. Or this yeah, if you if you go to this exhibit, it might give you a little bit more context. <laughs> it's kind of overlaid the proposal on the existing condition. But if you could put another some plantings out front or something, I don't know, or even shrubs. Or right, cut that big old tree down. Let's do that, right? Yeah, that's that's part of it, um, and that. that's kind of what we're showing. On the on the town, on the uh, snow shelf, is it? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but I, I think he means up near the building. When you say, so when you say near the building, what do you? Take a look at it. If you yeah. Think you need. Sure. Okay. Um, are there any? This is a public hearing. So, is there anybody from the public? Who, are they done? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Is your presentation done? done? Ed, thank you. I think there were a number of questions for for the traffic. So we'll. Oh, fine. <clears throat> Good evening. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Andrew Valeri. It's V as in Victor. I L L A R I. I am a uh, licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. I am the traffic engineer on behalf of the applicant Chase Bank. Uh, I understand that um, it's 10 o'clock at night, so the traffic engineer is probably the last person that you want to hear from at this point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we did prepare uh, a traffic study. Uh, we can submit that to the board. Uh, we did, in large part, the same analysis or same level of detail that you heard from the traffic engineer from the previous application. You know, they, they're at the other side of the street. They looked at the intersection of Silas Dean and, and Mill Street. We did the same thing. Uh, we looked at how much traffic's going in and out of the existing driveways that would be reused. Um, in my view, that was uh, quite a conservative analysis. It's a bit of a bit overkill. Um, in light of uh, the development that we're seeking tonight, there's a uh, restaurant that's on the property. Uh, it's um, over 6,000 square feet. Uh, what we're proposing in the future is a, a Chase Bank location that's uh, around 3,500 square feet. So uh, as Mr. Chaplin mentioned, there's a reduction in square footage. So um, it would be very f um, seamless, in my opinion, for um, any restaurant tenant to move into that pad site that's there right now. It's got all the amenities that you need for a restaurant. Yeah, it's got the kitchen. Uh, it's got all the utilities that you need for uh, a restaurant. Um, it could be very seamless to have a restaurant at that site that's generating traffic. So it's important to keep in mind that we're only looking at the net increase between the existing restaurant and the future bank. Uh, and the square footage is, is being reduced. Um, so when you look at uh, peak traffic times and you reference the <clears throat> the Institute of Transportation Engineers ITE manual, uh, you can compare, is this going to be a traffic increase? Is this going to be a traffic decrease? Um, and what you actually find that in the middle of the day during a, uh, the weekday, 
um, this would be a decrease in traffic from the, any restaurant use that's open for lunch that could go into that space. Um, in the weekday evening and on the Saturday midday, there's a marginal increase. Um, but what's important to keep in mind is that it's far less than the threshold that the Connecticut State DOT identifies as in need of uh, uh, conducting further analysis. Basically, if you have a development that's generating less than 50 trips in a single one hour, um, the Connecticut State DOT identifies that as a project that would likely re uh, result in a no significant impact in, in uh, levels of service or traffic operating conditions, and, and that's essentially what we have. Uh, we, we ran that by um, the state as well. Uh, we did a level, of, uh, not a level of service, we did a trip generation analysis comparing the existing and future use. Um, we ran that by the state uh, to get their input on it. They agreed with the methodology. Uh, we are in the process of doing the administrative decision uh, application for the major traffic generator permit um, from the Office of State Transportation uh, Administration. Uh, so currently going through that project or process right now, um, but the early indication from the state is that uh, the methodology that we used, which means that uh, if you take a net uh, uh, analysis for what was on the site to what's going to be on the site in the future, um, they basically have identified that that is in accordance with what they would do, so um, they've okayed that, that analysis so far. Um, and, and, you, excuse me, and, and you did that because the whole site parcels A, B, C, and is it just the three of them? A, B, C yep. are all over the 200 threshold? Uh, yes. If you count parcels A, B, and C all together, they've got more than 200 parking spaces. Yeah, yes, you. that's correct. Um, so uh, to talk about the site plan, I hope, yeah, there we go. Uh, specifically regarding the comments regarding um, uh, queuing at the drive-through, uh, this drive-through and, and this use in general is, is a very benign use from a traffic perspective. Um, when you have a use that has a drive-through, logically you go to, in, in your mind, you may go to uh, a coffee shop with a drive-through or a fast food use with a drive-through where you could have a drive-through queue with 10, 12 vehicles. Um, that is not the case with a bank. Uh, it's really going to be used by one person at a time. Um, we've done multiple studies at uh, banks with drive throughs to figure out um, how long it takes, what the queue lengths are. Uh, we're very confident in this case that there wouldn't be more than four vehicles in the queue for the ATM, and that fits in the, uh, the drive through lane before you get to where the bump out starts. So the site's well designed, or you wouldn't have any backups that, you know, you don't have a queue that's going to wrap around the building. That just wouldn't happen um, because you're dealing with an ATM. You're not dealing with someone inside of McDonald's that might mess up your order and you have to wait there. Um, ATM transactions are very consistent. Um, you typically take about two minutes. Um, so we feel that um, uh, a four-car queue for the drive-through is sufficient and it wouldn't have any impacts on the site layout. The bypass lane um, is well designed. It really, the bypass lane really won't be used because the only reason that you uh, would go around the back of the building is if you're trying to use the ATM and in the odd circumstance where you decide to leave the drive through queue, you'd go around it. That's really the um, minority. I, I don't even think it's, I think 5% of the time would be a high estimate. Uh, the bypass lane really wouldn't be used. Uh, it's really just meant for an outlet in the event that someone does need to leave the ATM and doesn't want to wait if there is a queue forming. Um, to talk a little bit about the interaction that is met right when you leave the drive through ATM or the bypass lane, uh, you come to a drive aisle that services the rest of the shopping center, uh, and it's relatively close to the entrance right off of Mill Street. Um, we did uh, traffic counts at the intersection. We did traffic counts at the driveway, so we have a very good idea of how much traffic is currently going through that shopping center. And I say a shopping center, what I really mean is it's a, it's a mixed-use center because there's not really retail uses in there. There's the office building and there's medical components to it. Um, there's also the church or the fellowship building also there. All of these uses have different times of day when they're busiest. Um, you know, this uh, a branch uh, wouldn't be open on Sunday when you have the most activity from church. So uh, th there's a really complementary nature in this, the center that you have here. Uh, and based on the traffic counts that we've done, uh, there's not a lot of traffic that currently goes through there. Uh, so albeit possible for there to be a scenario where... Um, someone is zooming around the, uh, 
uh, the bypass lane. A, there's not going to be very many people using the bypass lane. There's not going to be very many people using the drive-through in general. And B, the interaction when you get to the driveway on Mill Street, that operates quite well today where you don't have a long queue forming that would block that lane. Um, so we think that the site plan is uh, well laid out. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. I'll make a comment. It help, might help, too. Uh, today I went down there to see the site, probably a second time. And um, I went out about 3, 3.30, I think, out on the Silenstein. Got all the way across to the other side and made a turn on Mill Street East. No problem. I got out there, only one car coming through so at the time. So, you know, it's workable in there. In other words, uh, the, the uh, board and across the street, there's no left turn going out onto the Silestine from their driveways, right? But that, there's a lot of traffic coming out of the uh, residential building when it opens. But, you know, just a, a comment. It wasn't that Understood. at all. I was surprised. Other, other questions? It's, are, are you one the last the speaker? So we just have one more witness, our ah. architect, who just wants to give you a very brief overview of our proposed elevations, just to give the board the flavor of what it's actually going to look like. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, just for the record, from Matt Cara, TPG Architecture. Just looking at the elevations, I'll go briefly right through it. At the base of our building, we're going to have a manufactured stone, which will wrap around throughout the building. On top of our manufactured stone is our brick finish. And along our brick finish, as you can take a look at the elevations, we have window openings, which are our storefronts, anodized aluminum storefronts with insulated glass. If you take a look at elevations uh, north and south, those will be major storefront entrances. Um, east elevation is where most of our um, offices will be, so they will be clear windows. And then the west elevation is all spandrel glass. That's where back of our house um, rooms are. And then on top of our brick is our crown, which is the EFIS finishes. We have two different EFIS finishes, as you can see by the elevations. And on top of our main entrance, we have a hip roof, which has a shingled, asphalt mm -hmm. shingled finish. And um, if this thing ever stops, okay. <laughs> and then uh, on top of our main entrances, we have an ACM panel. We have our Chase silver finish, as well as our Chase blue finish. And that pretty much, you know, describes all of our finishes that we'll be using for the exterior. No, the red, reddish brick, right? Reddish brick, real correct. Brick. Okay. Yes, real red. Is that what you like? Is that what you like? So just um, some site signage. Um, on, at the exterior of our building, we'll have our, uh, you know, monumental chase signage. As you like the brick, the base is all red brick. And then on top of that, we have our, you know, chase silver illuminated signage. Moving forward, on our north elevation, which is our main entrance, uh, we have a chase signage that will go on top of the canopy. And also, we will have the, uh, the blue awnings that, which, that will go on top of all the clear windows, just for some... Uh, you know, some sunshades. On our southern elevation, it's the same concept. We have our chase signage as well as our blue canopies. And on our east elevation, we have another chase signage. And lastly, the west elevation. Unfortunately, this one does not have any signage. And uh, just some um, right away signages that we'll have throughout the, you know, throughout the space, throughout the exterior spaces just to direct drivers, you know, don't turn left, don't turn right. This is where our ATMs are. Just give direction for the customers. Just to yep. ask about that, I thought you said the only drive up was the ATM. Correct. Okay. Yep. The sign says drive up and drive up ATM. Um, this, we'll edit this one. I mean, each, okay. each, uh, each space that we have, each site that we have is, you know, site specific. So if we only have one, We'll make it site specific. Right. Um, just going through, you know, all of our banks are ADA compliant. We have our ADA signages, stop signs, right-of-way signs. 
And this is our signature uh, drive through canopy. And then the rest of our, all of our interior ADA signages, as you were asking before, uh, you know, uh, for the, for the ADA tellers, we have the, the hearing. Peter, these, the sign program come into play? We'll have to do a secondary uh, review of the sign packages. A few things in there that don't, don't quite uh, fit our, some of our requirements, but we'll deal with that as a separate uh, design review process. And uh, lastly, this is, this is the Chase Branch that we're aiming to achieve, and this is what it would look like at nighttime. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, the back side, you know, toward the back, that west driveway, looks a little bare. I mean, it, there's no trees, no nothing out there. Just, I mean, I realize where it is, but sure. I don't know. <coughs> no. I'm not saying like the front, but, you know, something. And not even any signs I don't think <laughs> out there, but I don't know. It looks uh, kind of bare in some things. I think they had that. So you're referring to the west side, right? Well, I uh, the south side. You had it yeah, up, just the up. left. Oh. Right, so there's landscaping in front, um, which would, you know, beautify that, that facade. Something out there. Yep. So um, let me just go back and uh, design review. Has design review looked at this? Yes, uh, it was approved by them. Okay. So the site signage was not was not yep all right there's no wetlands there's no, no wetlands do we need a fire marshal review uh we will need a fire marshal we, review we we did reach out and um we sent him the plans and you know he's looking at them as we okay. speak okay all right is there anybody from the public who i'm um, back over there would you like to join us and if you folks would Give up the mic, my friend. Give it up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rob O'Connor, 180 Main Street. I'm going to talk really quick. I'm also the, um, one of the co-chairs of the Bike Walk Weathersfield. And sitting here looking at the plan, wondering what a pedestrian or a cyclist does to come to the bank and whether you guys have considered, just for instance, I don't have the thing. Um, when somebody's crossing the Silestine, say they live at the board and they want to walk over, they come over the crosswalk, how do they get to the bank? Because I see the, the, the one crosswalk in there is right where somebody's going to be making a, a whipping right-hand turn at them. And I'm just wondering, instead of having like a, a cut-through when they come across the crosswalk. You mean Mill Street? When they cross Silestine, that main crosswalk right there, if you came in there and had a, had a pedestrian egress there with a crosswalk there, a car would have a longer sight line to, you know, they, if, if they make a right-hand turn, from the Silestine into that ATM driveway and don't see somebody, that I'm assuming that's the crosswalk you want to have a pedestrian coming over across, right? And just considering like maybe another way for them to get in there. <clears throat> I realize that not a lot of people are gonna bike over to there, but, but the people at the board and will have their little bikes they can use and you, do, you guys don't even have the shiny silver chase bike rack as part of your package, which I think should be in there. I mean, most of them do, like New York City, they, you know. Okay, you don't want them to put any banking. Uh, you're, you're the biker, rather, on the bank. Yeah, they want to. They want to bike. Well, I figure the, the, the people who don't have cars are going to be saving like seven thousand dollars. They're going to be looking to, for a place to park that. So bring it over on their bike or walk it through. So, but, but definitely, I, I'd like that. I mean, in the in the it's a car centric nirvana, the Silestine, But the other project too, just would like to see developers just run what it's like to be a pedestrian or a cyclist and want to go to your facility. And leave it alive. So, thank you. Go to Liberty Bank because they want to cross the river. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Is there? Is there? I, I didn't. Yeah, you can just leave it there. I did. I, I did notice that's a comment from the staff, right? And so you offered. Yeah, so, so there were just a few items that our engineer wanted to touch upon, just that would actually respond to that in terms of bike rack. Okay. Well, well just for the record, we're going to put a bike rack in, and you know, we do have a connection. Um, to the public sidewalk on Silas Dean. I understand his concern of, you know, it's very close to the uh, driveway, um, but, you know, there's not too much we can do. Um, really, when you're turning into the site, you're kind of lowering your speed, and, you know, there's enough space where you should be able to, you know, 
uh, slowed down. If you were to see somebody, there is a crosswalk that's striped, and there will be signage for it. So, yeah, yeah, we you know potentially could put speed bumps and work with staff if that's something that becomes necessary. You can work out most of the staff comments and stuff. And yes. Like I said before, I, I just spoke with the engineer, and you know, with the exception of the things I talked about, um, we can comply with all of his comments. I do want to mention for the record too, we'll be putting in a you know hydrodynamic separator for water quality, um, and we'll work with him on you know everything else. So, as a condition, do you abide by the rules? We'll put that stuff on the map. If that's correct. If that's correct. Is there anybody else in the public who wishes to speak? Okay. I I just got two people who second gave me a motion. Yeah. I think I think we're good. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. The the one key thing that's I'm struggling with is whether um well I guess I guess it's done now. Yeah, uh, right? So what, we need could be the conditions, uh, So right. so we need we need to worry about George. We need we need to worry about the landscape. That's the concern, right? Is that the landscape waivers that are likely needed are not identified specifically, right? So, uh, as we as we condition this, I think we need to understand that you're kind of giving town staff, you know, the authority to do certain ones, right? Um, we can try ahead of time and just kind of talk about the fact that the side yard required, and, and it obviously is pretty tough to do it on a blacktop pavement right um, the frontage is going to come up short even if they do better right and the third one was no, the islands the islands is perimeter trees another one yep so so all those all those items are waivers and maybe there's another detail that we're we're talking about as well uh, you know, I, I think I can sit here and say I'm pretty comfortable with what the site is and, and what it, it's likely to become. The condition of the pavement, they're doing the right thing. They're doing full dig and they're parking next to the building and uh, paving and then milling and paving out to the property line on, on the front there. Okay? So they're doing, the, I looked at it and it looks good to me. Uh, so I what? I looked at the actual stuff. So are there other thoughts? And, and Peter, do you, do you do you think you're comfortable with that? Yeah, idea? there are no um, there are no deal breaking things. I think the applicants indicated a willingness to work with staff on uh, all of our comments. We would obviously expect uh, a written response to our our comments so that we have a document to start with to work out some of the conditions. But I think uh, they're all manageable. Um, the, as far as I'm concerned, that. The traffic uh, issues are non-existent. It's obviously a much less intense use. Uh, we would obviously like to see a copy of the traffic uh, a statement uh, f for us to review as well. So I think if you grant the waivers for the landscaping and you're comfortable with staff handling that, we're okay. And then obviously, um, uh, you know, working out the comments from the town engineer, from myself, and obviously from the fire marshal, uh, there's still, there's a fire lane on the one of the common driveways that I think has to be reconstituted. So there's a couple of odds and ends that I think he'll want uh, to incorporate into the final plan. But if you're um, comfortable with passing that on to us, I don't think there's uh, anything that's going to materially change the, the layout of the site that was presented to you tonight. Make a motion we approve application 2031-19Z, um, including the landscape waivers for side yard frontage landscaping on the islands and perimeter trees um, st stipulation that um, the applicant um, respond to all of the staff site plan comments received to date from the engineer and from the planner uh, and any additional comments provided by the fire marshal and also that um, proposed shared parking agreement be provided to the town second was, was the traffic in there? And it, there's, and no, there's no parking. Yeah. Shared access. Shared access. I'm sorry to interrupt. We can provide you with just a redacted portion of the ground lease that specifically describes what the parking and access <coughs> rights are in connection with that. So they're not sharing, you're not sharing any of your parking no. with anybody? No. 
Okay. And that's expressly stated in the lease. Okay. okay. Did you mention the traffic report? Or? So the traffic report is one of the comments. Yeah, so I the, oh, think okay. that was covered okay. from the town engineer. And that, that any additional um, site signage be approved for regulation and design review? Do you think we missed anything in that statement? No. Got it covered? No, I think you got it covered. No second? Second one. Thank you, Dan. Any, any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, for, the, uh, for the record, let me just, since we did have somebody leave, Joe, Joe is, has left, right? Right. Um, so we can have a ninth. Either one of you? Okay. We, we just can't have a tenth. Yolanda, you just voted. Thank oh, you. Did I? Okay. I, just voted. Right. I was going to allow Dave and, to and vote. We'd like to thank <laughs> Chase for establishing All right. one of the Good. first offices in Greater Hartford in Wethersfield. We think you made the right one. And I congratulate Jamie Diamond for making the biggest profit he ever has made last week. So, so you're good to go? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Super fan. Good luck. Ryan, Ryan, would you like to introduce the next? Sorry, I'm looking for the next. I lost my. I had so many pieces of paper. Well, you lost your spot. Yeah. Three point. <laughs> three point three. Public hearing application number twenty thirty two dash nineteen dash z. This is Tucker Lee seeking a special permit for a home occupation dog care at 249 Main Street. The applicant is here. I'm going to well, recuse myself from this. Thank you very much. Let the record note that uh, Rich is recusing himself. Welcome back. Thank you. So uh, introduce yourself and describe the issue. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tucker Lee, and uh, this is my partner, Marcy Berman. Um, I just want to clarify, uh, before we start, there's been a lot of confusion. Um, this is just for us to watch three dogs in our living room. This is not a large scale kennel. This is just watching dogs as if they were our own dogs. Um, we have been watching them through Rover.com. Um, that's where we're insured and we're taxed through. Um, they actually pushed for a house bill 7158 um, that allows, you know, um, for us to be exempt from needing a commercial kennel license if we watch three or fewer dogs in our home. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. What, what was yeah. that the first part? The, um, the uh, Rover.com uh, pushed for House Bill number 7158. So you're part of Rover.com? Yes. Okay. yes. So, so for those of us who don't know what that is? Um, it, it allows us to operate um, without a commercial kennel license as long as we uh, don't take on more than uh, three dogs. Sure. But that's Rover.com. No, they, they pushed for the care? House Bill that, um, that passed. Oh, I'm sorry. It's um, it's a website that um, that people can apply to uh, for people to find dog sitters, um, and that's where the billing goes through. That's where we're taxed. That's and they offer insurance in case anyone gets hurt. And and so who's who's licensing this? Can you do you, know? you are <clears throat> this commission? Yeah. The uh, statute she's referring to exempts them from state commercial kennel licensing okay. not local zoning regulations okay yep. yeah. so um, in, in fact I actually spoke to animal control officer gates of uh, the Department of Agriculture telling him what had happened and he he was um, surprised because uh, this has not happened in any other town that he's heard of of someone like me needing to request um, a home occupancy um, oh, okay so so let's let them finish how do you plan on operating this business in your home? Sure. Um, it, like I said, um, the dogs are cared for alongside our dogs. You know, they're in our living room. We, um, you know, they, they get to play there. We take them out on frequent walks. They're on leash. They're supervised. Um, 
we, we clean up after them. Um, you know, we've been doing this for two years, um, starting previously in our last home, um, all five-star reviews, almost 100 reviews. Um, we, we meet dogs ahead of time and screen to make sure they're not aggressive and that they follow instructions. Um, we don't believe in kenneling dogs. They, they have, you know, they can walk around. We don't put them in crates or anything like that unless it's to separate them so they can eat. Um, they're, they're comfortable. They're, they're allowed on our furniture. Um, it's essentially a dog bed and breakfast. Um, someone's always home. They're, uh, once again, always supervised. Um, we don't let them onto private property. Their waste is always cleaned up and removed during walks. Uh, we have plastic bags and scoopers that we bring around. Uh, the Historic District Commission approved for us to have a picket fence that's uh, going to be enclosed where the waste will be removed daily. Um, and you know we've been providing the service to people in the local area, we, uh, including uh, neighbors who had a family emergency who needed a dog sitter at the last minute because they had to fly to Arizona for ch uh, one of their children. Um, we hope to be able to continue to care for dogs in our home, um, and that we sit, yeah, for for the three dogs. Um, and as we put in our um, application, we'll have no employees. The occupation will be in, uh, for less than 25% of our residents as a uh, marked on the attached floor plan. Uh, we are requesting permission for dogs to be dropped off by their owners. The owners would park in the spaces at the front of our house in order to transfer care. There will be no retail sale of merchandise. Um, and we were going to ask to be able to groom, but there's been a change in regulation, so we're no longer requesting for that. Um, and we will not have a commercial vehicle. Um, I don't want to digress too far from the main concern. I know people have been upset about the exterior of our house. It hasn't been finished. We've been working tirelessly to upgrade this home. It's been vacant for years with no updates, broken windows, and rotting fences. We have gone through multiple contractors and have been looking for new ones when they fail to complete their work in a timely manner. As for concerns regarding how us watching a handful of dogs will impact the neighborhood, this the neighborhood is completely filled with dogs. They see 30 dogs walking by the neighborhood frequently. We picked the area because of it. Um, we also clean up after some of those dogs. Right. Um, and regardless of tonight, like we're still going to have our own dogs. Like they're still going to be in our yard. Like so. We have two dogs. And we are consistently cleaning up after neighbors' waste because we find that sometimes our neighbors are not cleaning up after their dogs, so we try and make sure that the area is beautified, not just for the neighborhood, but also for us. You know, um, <clears throat> we've also spoken to our closest neighbors to make sure that they haven't uh, been hearing any barking or that hasn't affected them. They, they told us that they weren't even aware that we were caring for extra dogs um, and they haven't been dis disrupted by barking. Uh, we've been told they had some issues with feces found on the property, but I reassured them that, that it wasn't us. Um, and that we end up picking up a lot of the waste, including when we walk in Standish Park. Um, we have a variety of clients who come into town and patron the restaurant here. Uh, we make recommendations for them to, um, for restaurants that we know that are very dog friendly. Um, you know, we really love this town and we hope that we can continue to, you know, um, thrive here. Yeah. So, continue to thrive here. Right. Uh, just. Two quick questions. The so you have two dogs. Does this mean you you can take on three? Like so, like the two that live in the home don't count towards the three. Right. This is for three three dogs. I would take for for you know um, compensation. Okay. And are you required like a certain amount of outdoor time on your property or walking one or the other? Like for, uh, like in order for like the rover. Um. There's no regulation there, but we will take them every three to four hours. Okay. One of us is always there. They are never left alone. So just operationally, these three dogs are not the same three dogs every day? Correct. You know, we, um, through, through the rover.com, people find us. They book the times that they would need someone, um, and we make arrangements. And we don't always have three dogs. Sometimes we'll have no dogs. Sometimes we'll have one. Um, maybe during holidays, we'll have three. And, and how long might one normally book 
a stay for? Is it a you know a week thing, or is it two hours so that they can go have dinner? Yeah. I mean, it, it depends. Some people book us for the day. Some people go on vacation for a week. Some people just want a night or two. Thank you, George. George. Yeah, uh, I want to ask Peter a question in relation to these to the young ladies. Uh, how come they haven't finished the work we approved prior to this? I'm not or sure why. They? I'm not sure why you're asking me that question. Yeah. Well, ask them. Yes. Okay. Why haven't you? When I go down to Old Weathersfield and walk, and I don't live down there, and I see material piled on your porch, mm -hmm. nothing happening, looking like you're almost not living there, but you had a number of things, including a parking space, which you may or may not want anymore um, and I'm a little bit disturbed that uh, you're not fulfilling your obligations from a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago whenever it was approved. Um, it was it was a year ago um, as I mentioned before we've been having issues with contractors the parking lot was supposed to be put in in September and there have been delays um, as for the windows we uh, had to uh, ha have a contractor removed because he was um, not following uh, our requests. Uh, it's, um, although this is unrelated to our request for our, um, what we need done for our own residents, this home occupancy. Well, it disturbs me as a commissioner, and I'm sure maybe others on the commission, that, you know, these, and this is an important part of the town, and I realize that building next to you on the corner uh, nobody seems to want to move ahead over the years. I must, must have been on this commission a number of times. We've approved things there. Nobody ever went ahead with it. But that isn't the point. The point is you haven't completed the work, and I think it takes away from the whole area, including Comstock Ferry, which is a prized location in this community and in all weathers field. So it, it bothers me right now. Well, I You're coming in and asking for something and you haven't completed the last approvals that we, we gave you. This is uh, for our... Well, you got a good reason for it, fine, but um, that means to me that you just are not able to complete whatever you want to do. Well, this you have nice ideas, but you don't follow through. Well, this is again for... for some well, this is once again for our residents, and this requires no building or anything. This is just permission to continue using our home for what we need to. Um, for the business section, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, we had someone ready to begin the parking lot, but then we were waiting on engineering to uh, finalize the mylar. So what we were thinking was going to happen in summer, waited till fall, and then fall came along, and then somebody else couldn't do what they were supposed to. So, so back to the operations of this little business. Um, you mentioned a fence. Yes. Um, so are you asking, are you basically describing this business as it, it would use your outside yard, you'd propose the fence in the whole yard, and then, you know, potentially the dogs would be out there. Um, uh, just, you know, a free, not on a leash. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. I mean, not on. Um, so this is going to be on the side of the yard where there would be no parking lot. Um, and a, as for that, the, the dogs are not going to be just out there. Like, I'm letting them out to, to stretch their legs, to, you know, do their business, and then I will take them back inside. They're, it's not going to be anything like I, I heard there were some issues on the Silas Dean where they were just being left out there all day to make noise and bother people. That's, that's not the purpose of that, that area. So that's the south side, right? Correct. Towards, towards loose. Was there, a, <clears throat> was there a plan or a location map? You know, not, not that you need a formal survey plan, but is there something? No, it was not submitted with the application. There was a floor, there's a floor plan in your packet um, that shows the uh, second floor uh, layout, but um, it, it was news to me about the outside yeah. fenced, fenced area. So, any additional questions for the applicant before we turn to the public? Peter, who is uh, Officer Gates again? He's with the uh, State Department of Agriculture. They uh, handle licensing for kennels, for um, dog grooming, uh, those kinds of activities. This won't be a grooming, it's just daycare. Period. Correct. Do you have air conditioning in your house? Yes, central air. Then why three in addition to the two you have? 
Uh, that is what the uh, House bill is uh, allowing us to do. What will your fee be? Is it a daily fee per dog? Uh, yes, and it uh, depends on um, on the what they, they ask for. It's all listed on our website. One of the <clears throat> requirements for special permit that the use be compatible uh, with the rest of the neighborhood. And I'm having a difficult time getting my friends around that uh, this type of business is compatible um, you know, with the neighborhood down in <clears throat> Old Wethersfield. It's next to our Jewel uh, property, Comstock Ferry. Uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's an area which is prized for, for tourism and the addition of additional animals. Uh, I don't think it's compatible with, with the neighborhood. I guess I'd counter that by saying that there's a number of businesses that have dog bowls out in front of them mm -hmm. because it's a pretty heavily used area of pedestrians and pedestrians with pets. So I, I, I guess I don't really see the percentage increase being that significant. I'll just, just to counter, like just to, you know. One, one of the questions I had was trying to envision this, you know, on a, on a spring day or, so when you have, when you have um, a couple of dogs, you have two dogs, and let's say you'll have up to three. Mm -hmm. So when you take them out for a walk, would you be taking them out for a walk also during the day? And would you take all five at a time? How does that work? Uh, we, we try to avoid doing that, especially when it's crowded. We'll take them two or three at a time, depending on size and um, temperament. You know, obviously, if I have like two, very, two or three calm dogs, like I'll take them with me. Um, if I have two rambunctious dogs, I might take them together or even by themselves. Okay. That's what I'm going to cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> They're all very sweet, I promise. Um, so if there are no additional questions at the moment, um, I, George? Uh, did you say you're putting up a fence around the back property? Yes, we actually have what the material. What does it look like? I don't see anything in front of me, or you didn't present anything. Um, it's, it's been approved by the Historic District Commission. Uh, it's a picket fence. Uh, we had the rotting two-and-a-half-foot picket fence from before. It's been removed. We're waiting for the weather to get better to put in the three-and-a-half-foot tall uh, uh, new picket fencing that will also have an enclosure. Three-and-a-half, you said? Three-and-a-half. Picket fence, what, what color? Uh, it will, will be white. Compatible with the neighborhood, you think? I, 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 I hope so. It's replacing the previous replacing picket fence. Presented that tonight, I think. The one that was there was the same style. Okay. So, so if you if just uh, would the applicant uh, allow us, you know, vacate the mic and we'll ask the public if there's anybody to come oh, up. I'm sorry, you want us to pass the? No, no, just uh, oh, have yeah, a seat and I'll call the. I'm sorry. Is there somebody from the public? Yep. Hello. Uh, my name is Catherine Coca, for the record. Um, I'm not a resident of this town. I am a client of Marcy and Tucker's. Um, I'm also a graduate psychotherapist practicing out of Waterbury Hospital and a pre-doctoral student at CCSU. I work full-time. Um, I'm finishing my clinicals. I'm in my last semester of classes of my master's degree, and I'm applying um, for research to finish or to begin my doctoral degree. Um, I specialize in child and adolescent trauma. Um, I also have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder myself. Because of this diagnosis, I decided to purchase a puppy to train as a TSA. That acronym means um, uh, Therapeutic Support Animal. Um, <laughs> I um, attribute being able to do all of this uh, to Marcy and Tucker. Um, I met Marcy and Tucker over one year ago on Rover, seeking a daycare for my seventh month old puppy. And they were a wonderful fit. Uh, my puppy, Luca, she began daycare with them and started going two to three times per week, um, sometimes in the company of one or two other animals, um, sometimes just by herself, depending. Um, this allowed me to uh, continue my graduate degree, my clinicals, and also have somewhat of a social life amidst the chaos. Um, 
With Tucker and Marcy, this was the first time my puppy was able to socialize. Uh, TSA dogs, um, uh, therapeutic support animals, are required to be able to interact with other animals. Um, Luca, my puppy, she learned how to socialize with other dogs. She learned boundaries, sharing food and toys, support and potty training, which she was still working on at the time, uh, being comfortable with other people, sleeping over, and um, being on a feeding and um, using the bathroom schedule. Um, Tucker and Marcy have actively participated in Luca's training um, leading up to her um, TSA attainment. Um, they provided positive reinforcement, support, and supplemental learning. Um, if I had a veterinary concern about my animal, um, I could go to them. They would give me a lot of advice so I didn't have to go to my hometown veterinary uh, center and spend hundreds of dollars that I don't have. Um, so they've been very helpful with that. Um, furthermore, not only did they provide me with care for my dog, but we've become very close friends. Um, I met them a little over a year ago, and they're very special people to me. Um, I also met them when I was in the midst of a violently abusive cohabitative relationship, and I needed a neutral ground to be able to drop my dog off so that my ex-partner could pick her up, and I didn't have to um, intertwine with that at all. Um, they knew the situation. They accommodated um, gracefully and willingly. Um, they also weren't apprehensive of taking me on as a client, knowing that I had um, this going on in my background. Um, they also were there just to kind of talk to me and help me. This fostered my growth as an individual and gave me peace, being able to do the things I was able to do, like finish a graduate degree, and um, as a minority woman, uh, might I add, um, I was also able to switch jobs and begin proposing research for my doctoral degree. Um, I followed them from their location in Hartford um, to Weathersfield. I currently drive 20 minutes out of my way so that I can drop my dog off to them because I know that she's receiving comprehensive and adequate care. Um, I also, after that, had adopted a special needs dog, um, so I needed to spend a lot more time at home, so my time with them became a little bit less. Um, however, they were always there, so very much willing and able and even willing to take on um, uh, training with this dog, or take on care for this dog that I had acquired who had special needs, um, just mainly with um, grooming. He wasn't able to clean himself well. He had some prior injuries, taking a lot more time for his care. Um, I lost my dog um, a few months ago, the special needs animal, and he was getting ready to go to daycare because he was ready to socialize. Um, it was wonderful. Tucker and Marcy were there for emotional support, and they actually provided care for him in his final hours, as well as provided emotional support to me. Uh, when the cease and assist occurred um, around Thanksgiving time, I was devastated. Uh, I had just lost my dog, my other new dog, and my puppy was pretty much um, needed care again. She didn't have anyone there with her anymore, no other dog. I was never home. Despite their hardships and the cease and assist order, um, they went out of their way to care for Luca at different locations, coordinating, coordinating times and places where they could take care of her just so I could get to class. Um, I've never met anyone like that in my life. Um, as humans grieve, so do dogs. It's a statistical and scientific fact. Um, they helped Luca and I get through the worst of these times, and they helped her um, socialize once again. I have, um, talking about their property now, um, I don't know if any of you have been in their current residence any recent time while they've occupied it. Um, I've been in it more times than I can count, uh, socially as well as to drop my dog off for care. Um, and I'd have to say that um, there is no lack of space in there. Um, the dogs are able to roam freely, play, exercise, uh, socialize, which is extremely important for their development. Um, also, and this is despite their vigorous and expensive renovations um, that they are currently doing. Um, I've also never seen or smelled excrement or urine um, anywhere in or around the property. I've been all over the home, outside of it. I've never seen any type of fecal matter, extra matter whatsoever. Um, the home is well maintained and they ensure cleanliness for all the dog's safety, um, as that is very important when you're caring for other people's animals and your own. Uh, the dogs in their care are walked extensively, so I know that there were um, some uh, few and very insignificant complaints um, provided against them. 
and I know that exercise was one of them. These dogs are walked vigorously multiple times a day, um, and they play all day long. Uh, when I pick up my dog, she falls asleep in the car. Um, I have sleep issues due to post-traumatic stress disorder. She sleeps the entire night. Um, Marcy and Tucker, they have done a monumental job renovating their home, and they're doing it themselves. They're not hiring people to do all this for them. They're doing it themselves, something that I can't do. Prior to their renovations, past and still under, undergoing, the house was highly outdated, requiring modern necessities. It was kind of more like a stain on Main Street in Old Weathersfield, a place that I frequent often to walk my dog. Tucker and Marcy have put every ounce of their time, effort, and funds into building a home and a business, all of their time and their effort and their money. They have loyal clients for a reason. They're the cream of the crop at what they do, and they do it very, very well and I trust them. As for the few irrelevant and solely speculatory complaints, I'm disappointed in how negatively this community has received them since they came here solely to um, thrive in this community, to create a small business, interact, meet new people. Um, they chose this area for that. Um, they've also put a lot of work into running this beautiful historical home, beginning a progressive and com comprehensive business serving this community. Um, which also supports local businesses. I can honestly say I probably get food to go or frequent the restaurants here whenever I pick up my dog because I have to get home and I have a 20 minute drive home. I am I'm hungry, I wanna stop, get something to eat. Um, some of the shops are very cute. I can sit and read my book for a little while. Um, I, I frequent this town because of them. Um, I spend money in this town because of them. Um, I believe that they also support local businesses because of this. Um, as far as um, I would like to say the barking issue, that was um, all speculation. It had no empirical basis whatsoever. Having been inside the property, around the property, and interacting with these people regularly, um, I actually, um, I'm, I'm surprised that someone would speculate that there would be a lot of barking um, because I, I don't hear any when I'm outside, not even when I drop my dog off. Um, there was a complaint which was extremely far-fetched and bizarre, uh, predicting that the dogs would hear coyotes quietly frequenting the roads of Main Street from 1 to 5 a.m. I mean, I don't really understand that as an argument, um, nor is it justifiable, but these are the types of complaints that have come in. Um, as for, um, I believe that there was um, some issues as far as um, the lapse in the care of the exterior. I don't know if anyone here has ever renovated a historical house um, in an extremely conservative town, but it's not easy. It's very difficult, actually, and Tucker and Marcy have been working vigorously to do this while maintaining their own personal lives and relationships. Um, also, I would like to say, um, per another complaint that I had found in the email submitted to me uh, per Marcy and Tucker, so I had some reference. Um, I, I really, I don't understand how it would harm the area. Heirloom Market's a beautiful area. Main Street's a gorgeous area. I don't see how this would take away from that in any way or d deter it. Um, I would also like to say that um, I've only witnessed one to three dogs. I've never seen anything over that. There was a concern that there's five to 50 dogs in there, which isn't physically possible, nor would Marcy and Tucker make that decision to do that. Um, just in closing, I had a lot more to say, but I see some people are on their phones. You look a little bored, so I'm gonna try to make this quick. Um, I just wanted to say that um, not only have they been just absolutely monumental in my life and helping me out, um, being able to do the things that I would like to do, um, but um, per the commissioner uh, for section 22-344, his job is to find that this business provides sanitation, humane treatment of animals, and protection of public safety. And I think that they've done that um, very much so. And they have upheld this. They're kind, they're educated, they're caring. Um, they are committed to supporting animals and um, also maintaining the therapeutic value um, of the human and animal relationship. And I think that's important for you to consider coming from someone who's very much benefited from a TSA. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, yep. 
Hi, my name is Brianna Kingsley. Um, I'm not a resident, but I am a client. I'm from Hartford, uh, originally from Colorado, recently moved out here. Um, I met um, Tucker and Marcy through Trooper.com. Um, I think it was about September when we did our initial meet and greet with our puppy Trooper. Um, at that point, he was seven months and he was 50 pounds of love. Um, he is now 70 pounds and he actually turned a year today, so happy birthday to Trooper. Um, I just want to start off by saying that like, as individuals, um, they are some of the most like caring people that I've ever met. Um, they go out of their way to really accommodate, um, like I'm a very worrisome person to begin with and to leave like, I'm, I'm not saying that like dogs are like children, but they kind of are sometimes, you know, um, just leaving something that's very important to you in someone else's hands, you know, and I, when I met Tucker, we had also done two other meet and greets that week and I was like, you know, like I talked to my partner and I was like, this is it, you know, so as far as, or, um, as far as Trooper's time with Tucker and inside the house, um, I feel like he's completely safe. Um, as mentioned, he's no, he's not with more than like two other dogs at any time. Um, the area is very large, so he is able to move freely. Whenever he comes home with us, he is exhausted. And this is coming from a dog that is nonstop all the time. Um, he's very happy. Um, we're frequently updated. So uh, Rover has a, um, a system that, um, Basically, um, you can request for the uh, sitter to send pictures to you. So we're frequently updated, probably like once or twice every hour. Um, Tucker is really on top of it. Um, kind of puts my mind to ease, um, knowing that my animal is like really well taken care of. Um, and as mentioned, so I've been inside the residence. Um, it's always clean. The dogs are safe. Um, they're always well taken care of. They're always looked up, like looked after. Like someone is always making sure that like the dogs are regulated and not getting into trouble, um, because that's what dogs like to do when they're not when they're left to their own devices. Um, another thing that's um, important uh, when you have an animal like is to clean up after them. So as uh, Tucker mentioned, when the dogs are being walked, um, there's always waste bags at their disposal. The waste is picked up appropriately and disposed of properly. Um, when we did our meet and greet, actually, um, Tucker was talking about picking up after another dog. I was there when that happened. Tucker probably doesn't remember that, but it was the first time that we met. Um, and I mean, just like, I, I understand that like this town is important to you guys. Like this is like what you do. You make sure that like these businesses are like for the well-being of like your constituents and your people. Um, and I get like, like why this would be like, you know, like you, you want to look out for people. Um, and just like, even just being like in this area, like it's a beautiful area. And we really like just like stopping by when we drop Trooper off and we finally are free of our, basically like our, our toddler. Um, we walk around. <laughs> we walk around the parks. Um, we've stopped actually at um, Heirloom Market, which is um, you might be familiar. It's a seat to table um, restaurant. Um, I'm a full-time server at the Capitol Grill presently, so um, I really enjoy just being able to sit down and enjoy a meal. And I can do that when I don't have to worry about my dog. Um, and I think that's basically um, about it. I did mention, or I didn't mention, but um, the access to the building. It's um, it's you're all familiar with it. Um, I think because of its location, um, it is actually easier for people with special needs to drop their dogs off because Tucker can come literally outside and get the dog and get the animal um, if somebody needed that accommodation. So I think that is worth mentioning as well. I don't think I touched on that. Um, and I think that's about it. I know it's late, so thank you for your time. Appreciate you. So. Unless you have questions, I'm sorry. Nope, nope. I'm going to uh, take a moment to uh, indicate that the record has a number of pieces of correspondence. Uh, one Gail Fabian uh, on 304 Hartford Avenue writing to oppose uh, the size of the property and its location to Comstock. Um, and it goes on to say about barking and urinating, etc. cetera. Um, I'm gonna say Cindy and Howard Greenblatt of 35 Broad Street, another area resident. So let's see, I, they're uncertain. I don't know if they're here tonight. Bottom line is they too are opposed. The village business district is intended to provide for mixed use, um, business appropriate residences and preserving the historical character. Um, it goes on to talk about the, the values and, and basically they don't they approve, well, we do not approve, we do not approve of the request. All right. Uh, another one, uh, Mrs. Riley on Hubbard Place. Uh, I'm writing out of concern for the recent 
doggy daycare. I'm strongly opposed to this permit application as well. Another one, uh, another one, Nancy Batery. I uh, hope you will not allow the dog care proposed in Old Weathersfield. I don't have an address. I don't know if she's local or not. Um, a Michael Clark. Dog care is not a business that positively impacts the neighborhood. Um, conversely, it is something that could potentially negatively impact the neighborhood businesses. Uh, 330 Main Street. Another from Carol Zeminski, who I know is down there. Mega Park. Mega, Mega Park. <clears throat> she lists a number of reasons why she is uh, uh, very much against the proposal. Noise considerations, lot too small, village district should be reserved for village type activities, incompatible with zoning. Dangerous conditions, public safety. Um, it's in your packet. I'm sure you guys can read it. Another one from Larry Powers. I don't see immediately an address. This one is gets. I I urge the pink gets gets down to the end. I urge the board to deny this request. Um, Susan Alder, Alderman. Alderman. Okay. Is there an address on this one? I don't see it. Two buildings away on Main Street. Uh, two buildings away on Main Street and uh, opposed, uh, opposed to the application. Um, another individual, let's see, uh, Geneva and Michael Duty at 336 Main. We are in support of the the Tucker dog care facility on Main Street. It goes on to describe Tucker, a kind and caring person. Gina Rinaldi, uh, not seeing an address. Uh, it says I'm a, a resident of, of Weathersfield. Writing on behalf of Tucker Lee and in support of her watching dogs at her residence. Uh, oh, has been watching her dog, so it's a, uh, uh, a someone who seeks the services. And then a couple of other ones here. Linda Pinn, uh, I have concerns that the proposed activity is not a good fit for the neighborhood. Only a couple more, I promise. Um, Jennifer Pliss resides on Harford Avenue, expressing support for Tucker Lee's home occupation permit. Um, goes on to speak that everybody has a dog. Um, and it's not out of character is pretty much what she's saying. Karen Tashby, Roger and Karen Tashby on 245 Main, that they oppose the application for the, the doggy daycare uh, not being compatible with uh, the development in the area. I think that's all. Did you check me as I was going through? Uh, just a quick correction, Sue Alderman, uh, the handwritten one, that's, uh, that's in favor of us. I'm sorry, did, um, did I misstate that? I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm trying to. <laughs> Read quickly through the thing looking for words. Um, so that's a sentiment on a number of uh, pieces of correspondence. So now I think there was a hand up. Okay. My name is Jennifer Fiano. I am a client and I do not live in Wethersfield. I would like to say that I've been a client off and on for over a year. Uh, your previous residence and here in Wethersfield. Um, my dog has always been well taken care of. I have also received uh, text pictures and sometimes videos of the dogs playing if they're especially cute, which I love because it kind of makes my day. I work 10 to 12 hour days. I work six to seven days a week sometimes. Um, so I have a small army of people who help me with my pet and um, you know, I prefer to come here because I think that my pet receives the best care out of that army uh, here. Also, I have been in the house. The house has progressed. The house is only improved. It is spacious and well taken care of for someone who has dogs better than my own home, I would say, to be honest. Um, 
Maybe that's because I work too much. But anyway, <laughs> moving on, I know that the dogs are cleaned up after because I not only have one uh, bag receptacle on my leash, but I have two now because it runs out uh, in the care of Marcy and Tucker, so then I replaced them. So I added a second one to make sure it never runs out so that there's plenty of bags to pick up after. Um, I have never been there and not seen someone walking their dog or more than one person walking their dog. And I sometimes have to drop off my dog at 6.30 in the morning. And if I'm early, we'll walk around and talk to the other dog owners who are walking around. Um, I wasn't really familiar with the area before, and now, in the summer, I take my dog to get ice cream. I take my dog to get pizza. She doesn't actually get pizza, she gets the crust. It's my least favorite part. Uh, we go to Lucky Lou's, and I look forward to exploring more of Weathersfield. I hope that uh, I continue to have a reason to come here and enjoy this area, which I was unfamiliar with before, and I actually really do enjoy visiting. And I will continue to visit if it's a client or otherwise, because I, while we're not like close personal friends, this is a business relationship, I actually really value these guys, and I am lucky to have found them through Rover. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I can't really talk good. So I'll wrap this up. I think I covered all my little bases. Um, oh yeah, I've never heard dogs barking. Uh, one side of the house is abandoned. The other side is a large parking lot with a business. It's only open certain times of the day, but if I'm ever outside, I don't hear dogs barking. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Okay. Uh, Come on up. Good evening, Robert Smart, 62 Church Street, just around the corner from this proposed business. I uh, uh, looked over this document that was uh, available that described how this business would be run. And, and I had the impression it was three dogs, but, but now I get the impression that there's six dogs involved, three of ownership and three of care. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand that right or not, but... Two in the oh, house all the two. time. Two, oh, okay. Potentially three more. Okay. The, uh, the part of three dogs in care, if that's what the limit is going to be, it kind of puts a, a, a burden. No, I should stop for a minute, first of all, and commend you all for, for the dedication you're serving, listening to us at this hour. And, and I know your high salary you all get from the town. I think they ought to double your salary. And it still wouldn't be a burden to the town because double that one that you get probably... <laughs> but thank you anyway. You know your mathematics, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but back to the other one, the business at hand. Uh, it says three dogs, and, and they evidently provide a service that is really demanded. And I can foresee that three dogs and someone really needs some help. And maybe for just this short time, it's going to be four. Speculation. Or... Or, or, you know, if they're human nature, they can make a little more money if it's an extra one for a day. How are you going to determine that three is always met? Do you have the staff to check that? I, I, it's putting a burden on you all that, that I don't know if we're prepared to take on. Uh, I'm trying to be real brief here. I guess the, uh, the one thing that I'd point out is that uh, they're always uh, planning on cleaning up, and it sounds as if they indeed do a good job of cleaning up from after the dogs. But, but my wife has a very significant garden out in front, and these dogs that go walking by, those, 
Male dog, and we had a male dog for years. I have nothing against them. But they do have a tendency to mark their territory. And Martha's significant garden takes a hit every summer from some of that. And they like to urinate on it. And, uh, and, and I would imagine that as well-trained as these client dogs are, that those males still might have a little bit of that might endanger Martha's plants just a little bit more. So I just point that out as one more little thing. And, and they can't clean up from that. Those dogs are, they have a mind of their own, I noticed. Uh, the other one that I'd like to mention, that these dogs that they care for never bark, and, and that's really nice. I live next door to a lady that has three dogs of her own. And man, I'll tell you, those dogs do know how to bark. Maybe you all could stop by and train those dogs. Uh, in the winter, it wake you up at night sometimes, because they're sometimes out in the yard at night. In the summer, it's damned awful hard to sleep with that dog barking on an open window at night. So I, these real nice dogs that they've all had so far, it might turn out that there are some that do like to bark, though, so I point that out. It's, it's a business that's quite different from the other businesses that are there along Main Street, old, uh, a lot of restaurants, a lot of new development there. I, I like the way Main Street has been going. And this is a business that's just quite a bit different. So I'm not at all enthused about seeing it develop there. It's, it sounds like it's a service that's needed, but maybe not quite the right place. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Charles Milkright, 357 Main Street. Um, I'm a little bit on the fence uh, right now. Um, a doggy daycare with three clients sounds pretty benign, um, but I think there's a lot of sensitivity in the neighborhood, um, and I bet Mr. Gillespie knows this if he thinks about the <coughs> meeting minutes from September where he had to discuss uh, the noise from Lucky Lou's um, and the complaints there, which suggests that Old Weathersfield has noise issues, so there's definitely sensitivity. That same meeting, there was discussion of wag time and the noise there and how it was affecting uh, the folks on Deerfield um, and Lincoln Roads. And you know, I, I took a look at where wag time is and its proximity to residential uh, areas. And looking at that distance um, and then drawing a similar size circle around this property, it looks like there's about 28 residential buildings um, as close to this building as wag time is to the corner of Deerfield and Lincoln. Uh, so there's a lot of people that potentially, and I, and I stress potentially, could be affected by uh, noise if there was another wag time situation. And I know three dogs or five dogs is not 20 dogs. Supervised dogs are not dogs let, uh, free to run around. Uh, but I think it puts, um, I think, a responsibility on this uh, board to ensure that if this is um, approved, that the noise issues uh, that have already come before uh, you know, this group within the last year or two are not repeated. Um, I think the isn't the definition of an insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. Um, I think you know certainly three dogs or five dogs um, seems fairly reasonable, uh, but I think. There has to be uh, you know, the, the recognition that there may be a need for some noise mitigation. Uh, and it's not reasonable in Old Weathersfield to have a 10-foot fence uh, as, as WAG time now has. Um, so in that sense, I, th I think it's um, you know, a, a fine service. I, it sounds like uh, you know, there's very devoted clients, um, you know, very devoted business owners. Um, but I just want to ensure that the concerns of the neighbors uh, and the character of the, the business, not just the business district, but recognizing, again, old we the business district is a small part of Old Weathersfield, uh, that th those concerns are met uh, and that we're not back in a year 
uh, sort of having a redo of, of the WAG time discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leviticus Garibaldi, I'm not a resident, I'm from Hartford, I'm a client. Um, I wanted to clarify some things that really haven't been covered anywhere yet, and it's that, uh, so we're talking about five dogs, maximum. Their two dogs are about this big. Now when these dogs bark, you're not gonna hear it outside of one room, if at best. And most of the dogs that I've seen that have been babysat by Tucker have been about this big also. Our dog is probably about this big, got a little bit more of a bark. But if we're talking about five small dogs barking, you're not gonna really hear it. So this concern of noise is not, we're not talking, you know, they're not five German Shepherds, which are loud dogs. They're five medium to small dogs. And one of the things that Rover has is limitations that you can choose. You can say, I'm going to take in five small dogs or three small dogs or whatever the limitation is, or large dogs or medium dogs, whatever the capacity is that you choose. This house can handle large, but it's probably mostly going to see medium to small because that's what most people have around here, medium to small dogs. So that covers a very significant complaint that I seem to be hearing is how loud is it going to be? Probably not as loud as people are imagining because we're not talking about primarily large dogs that can be loud. Another thing that I find interesting is this recommendation of having a business to bring in tourists, how tourists are important to the city, how tourists are a big part of Old Wethersfield. I'm a millennial, so I use the internet. And if I find something that's in an area, I'm gonna check out a surrounding area. But more importantly, millennials use each other to recommend businesses more than anything else. Word of mouth is our biggest way of communicating to other people. So when I find out that Tucker lives next to a pizza restaurant, I'm gonna check out a pizza restaurant. I'm also gonna tell all my friends nearby that I found a cool pizza restaurant. This is a great way to bring business into your city because all of us like to have dogs. That's like the millennial dream is dogs, or cats if you're a cat person, but a lot of us are dog people. So having this as a business is beneficial to the city and the location is great because there's restaurants that are important to millennials like farm to table right there and pizza, two kind of big things. Um, the building itself, I don't, I don't know what it looked like beforehand because we just started like in October, something like that and you were working on your bathroom, I think, which I saw for the first time tonight, and it looks great. Like, the amount of work that you had to put into that, I couldn't imagine doing in probably, what, two, three months' time since the first time I saw you? No, you know what, it's still good work, you know what? And it, it, when you want to renovate a historical building, you gotta like living in it. That's important before you start saying, you know what, I'm gonna take care of what everybody else sees. So it will take time, I understand that, but the work that they've put into it has been fantastic so far. And I cannot wait to see it finished. I think that's something that really just prioritize it, it'll be great, but obviously things don't always go as intended. And this has taken up so much of your time, so much of your money, your effort, you know, your patience. And it, getting over this hump allows another hump to be tr tackled next, and that is definitely going to be restoring this historical building. So having this handled, great. Noise problem, probably not as big as people are saying. Location, fantastic because you know what, my mom now has a reason to go check out Martha's garden because she loves gardens. Because I can take her here because she loves historical towns. This is all a good culmination of things. And I would really appreciate if you guys take that into consideration. Thank you. Uh, question. So, question for you. Uh, appreciate the detail on the uh, the service. So, explain a little bit more about the size of the dogs. What's what's the definition? There's a definition to the size there of the is. dogs. There um, is. I don't know if Rover has a specific. Do you know if they have a weight specific? Yeah. They, so they have a weight specific. Something I think like 30 pounds for tiny dogs or something like that. Or yeah. I mean, my okay. dog is 70 pounds, and I can pick him up. He's about this big. You know, he's he's. A little bit big in the chest because he's a bulldog, but that's not, you know, that's about, on average, people refer to that as medium, sometimes large. Usually when you're talking about like German Shepherds, these are 130 pound dogs, you know, yeah. they're small children, okay. basically. So, so they, there's some sort of a weight? Yes. I'm seeing zero to 15 and 16 to 40. Thank you. 
and then yeah, and then it just goes up. Thank you. I'd like to comment when you put in your initial application, you look for sitters based on your weight preference. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, um, so I, I, there are other people that haven't spoken yet, so if you don't mind, thank you. Uh, Rob O'Connor, <clears throat> 180 Main Street, um, and I just want to listen, really come tonight to, to listen to, to the issues, maybe my neighbors, um, and some of my other Main Street neighbors have said it's kind of, I'm kind of neutral in it, I, I really want to hear, um, I think one of the things I can provide is People have mentioned that there are no businesses like this that pose the challenges, and I can testify that there's a business across the street from me where the same kind of issues occur. Noise, urination, throwing <laughs> cigarettes, <laughs> drunkenness, <laughs> beeping horns, slamming doors, peeling out their motorcycles. And I don't think those things are really in the, in the regulations either, and they're, they're certainly not watched over i mean i think i think this this business inside of a home i think they should be watched over i think they should be policed by neighbors i find myself policing my neighbor across the street and sometimes it's harder you know than other times but um <clears throat> the noise and the noise situation i think for three dogs if it's loud neighbors should go complain and have it taken care of and uh, Councillor allard like when you've made a I think one of the other things where you said this is a counterpoint, I basically just wanted to make a counterpoint. There are other businesses that are more challenging and it's all where you, you know, where you live. I mean, somebody who's looking at the wag time situation who lives on the other side of town, they're gonna to assume, you know, what's the big deal, a couple of dogs barking. Somebody who lives next door to dogs barking, they're the loudest things you can hear. Somebody who has a fire whistle blow in their bedroom window says, hey, it's only, it only happens at noon and you know, when there's a fire, so it's not that bad. But um, so I, I think that they've done a good job presenting their case, and I'm glad that you guys are the commissioners who have to make the decision. So good luck. Thank you. Any other first time speakers? Well, Happy New Year, everyone. I guess this is my first time seeing you guys. Um, well, I want to clear up some things because I, I heard some things and I was up, oh, sorry, Paul Brady, 1618 Church Street. So I am technically not your neighbor, but your neighbor, right? Because I'm the first one on Church Street when you come around the corner. So I'm a millennial. I just got knocked off the calendar. I'm 32 years old. So to tell anybody that um, it's hard to restore a historic house, my house is 200 and about 30 something years old. Looking at him, I pay to learn. So I know what it's like, okay? However, I, um, when it took me all but 10 seconds to make my decision on what house I wanted, I knew what I was getting into. My responsibility is that I was gonna be an, a homeowner and there are certain things that was expected of me. So, yeah, I cough up a couple thousand dollars here and there, but I signed up for it. Got to take care of the property. I, that's my responsibility. So um, I heard, you know, one of the people supporting you said, you know, the excuse of it's hard to take care of a historic house. Well, it's, it's what you signed up for. Do your research before you do things. If I'm, go if I'm in Stop and Shop and I'm gonna buy um, you know, a case of eggs, I could tell you that before I bought it, I calculated if it even makes sense to buy 12 or 24. That's just how I operate. Maybe, you know, so research is something good. So as it relates to the business, there I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, Tucker, and hello, Marcy, nice to meet you. I am sitting there and I'm very disappointed and heartbroken. Number one, I'll tell you why. I'm the kind of person like this, I hate to feel like I've been taken for a ride or made a fool of. <clears throat> Originally, when you got your cease and desist order, you came over and we had a conversation. It's 
speak to us. And, you know, um, the truth be told, you know, you said you weren't running a business and you did mention about the dog poop. Yes, I'm the person that tossed two, shoe, two pairs of shoes in the garbage because in my backyard I stepped in dog poop. Fine. I asked you about, I asked about it and she mentioned that it wasn't her. I, made no, I did not make a stink about it. That's just what it is. Because I'm the kind of person like this, if I ask you something and you say it's not you, let it go. Life's too short. For, to be accusing you further. Say it's not you, I'll let it go. Now, to sit here and to hear that, there, that all this time there is some form of a business just makes me feel like an idiot. You visited me twice. The last time you visited me was on MLK Day. And I told you when you asked, and I, I mentioned, I would not give anybody, not the town, not my neighbor, a letter supporting or going against it. After all, I do so, I've said this time and time again when I come up to this mic to speak, I support businesses in every community. They're good for our community. However, if they are going to be adversely affecting neighbors and impacting properties in the wrong way, then maybe they need to be relocated somewhere else. It's the reality of it. Now, I understand that this is now the second time that this board has had to deal with this type of issue as it relates to dogs. And the idea that there is only gonna be three dogs, I understand that, it's in our house. However, my question to you guys are, are you guys giving her a fence? Because a three foot fence is not gonna hold a St. Bernard. Because from what I'm understanding on that application, three dogs, it could be three any dogs. A Great Dane, a German Shepherd. I have a six year old. He's this tall, but he is terrified of dogs. That kid sees a dog, and he, it's like he wants to disappear. So for anyone to sit here and to say that these dogs are not going to bark, all dogs don't have the same behavior. I understand that. I've, I, cannot, I can never say that, you know, that I, I, I specifically heard at any given point that you had dogs barking profusely, coming, you know, barking coming from your house. A matter of fact, I don't even listen for that. You know, half the time, if I, if I leave here to go to work, I'm back late, I'm tired, I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna talk to people at times. I just go in my room, fall asleep. But the truth of the matter is, something needs to be done. And I understand that this state passed this law, while the town, as, as, as a board, maybe you guys need to write a letter to the town attorney and get the mayor involved in this, and pass some type of local law in, in, in correlation with what the state passed so there are specific guidelines for people that want to do this. We don't need to keep coming back here about this, about dogs, dogs, dogs. Yeah, everybody in, in Wethersfield walks dogs. We like dogs. I don't own one, but at the end of the day, you know, if I'm going to be affected by it the wrong way where I'm on my property and I'm stepping in dog poop, I'm going to be mad, and especially when, I have to, well, especially when I have to toss a pair of Sperry's that I just bought for $160. Not cheap. I get that. And, you know, and for the people that are saying that they're not from the, yeah, you're not from the community. And I, I know it may seem like, you know, um, or people may have the, the idea that, you know, you're being treated some way. Let's be realistically. I've been in this town for almost five years now. The people on my block, Mr. Smart, some of the nicest people I've ever met. They pass, they say hello to you, and you know, no one bothers anybody in Old Weathersville. We're all welcoming to you. So, you know, we want to see you have a business, we want to see you succeed. I've said that to you time and time again, inside my house, outside my house, I want to see you succeed. Because that means the community is going to do good. It's good for everybody. But what we don't want is for anything that you're gonna do that's gonna adversely affect the community. And I can't see how three dogs, okay? Three dogs at any given time is an optimal number for anybody that's running a business to make money. We're all humans, and I'm gonna be honest with you. At the end of the day, if there's another way for me to make some more money and I feel like no one's getting hurt, I'm gonna do it. We're human, because at the end of the day, you gotta provide for your family, you gotta pay bills. 
when the assessor assessed my property, he doesn't say, oh, Paul didn't make enough money this year. He, I just got to pay my taxes. So with that being said, I hope, you know, that you guys make the right decision on this. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you for or against it. But at the end of the day, you know, it's really up to you guys. And if she's going to do something like that, there's other things that need to be put in place, such as a fence, because a three-foot fence is not going to work for any dog that's over a certain weight. Because I could just step over a three-foot fence. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up on some of the noise concerns because I think there was a comment that five small or medium dogs won't make a lot of noise. Um, there was, uh, I think, an article in the Rare Reminder that pointed out that the noise uh, or acoustical tests being done at WAG time measured uh, 72 decibels um, from was sort of the amount of noise being made by about 20 excited dogs. 20, yeah. Um, and I, I, let's let's hey yeah, let's. conversation is up here it's not between you guys okay okay the um you know the, the question then is for five dogs how much noise how many how much noise would that make uh decibels is on a log scale um and so if you double the number of uh noise sources you know all say at 72 decibels uh, then you end up with 75 decibels give or take uh, conversely, if you cut it in half, say 20 down to 10, you end up with 69. If you cut that down to 5, then you end up with 66 decibels. Uh, to put that in context, uh, the complaints um, regarding the music from Lucky Lou's, uh, that I believe was measured in the 60 to 70 decibel area. Uh, I also believe that uh, the uh, noise ordinance in Weathersfield uh, limits daytime noise at 55 decibels. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put some numbers on this. Um, that, I'm not saying that there's going to be excited, five excited dogs barking all the time outside, uh, but that any um, sort of guidelines, limitations, stipulations recognize that even a five dogs, um, if in the right conditions, can violate uh, the noise ordinance and essentially uh, recreate some of the, the situations we've had. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Please click. And, and new issues. New issues if you could, please. Um, it would just be to rehash something that's already been mentioned. But um, just to go over like what was comment, like literally just said, that's basing an assumption off of something that actually isn't scientifically proven. Um, and then also, going off of something that was said earlier on the question of philosophical, um, I guess you could say, arguments based on human nature, I don't really think that is taking any precedence um, related to this issue presently. Just saying. Thank you. Should be a logical argument. Yes, sir. Kieran Williams, 149 Garden Street. Um, man, I've talked to you guys before for how many months as Dan Silver just goes, oh, here we go again. Very conflicting. Sweet kids, there's no doubt in my mind. You guys Could, all like, Mr. love, Williams? respect what they do. I'm just commenting, I'm not asking. But emotions aside, because I heard enough of that with WAG time, this is a business decision. It's not emotions. It's not personal. It's not taking on anything other than what the hell makes good common sense. My first question is, why are we talking about this now? How long have they been in operation? I'm asking you guys the question. I don't know. Can I ask them? How long have, would you ask them how long they've been doing this? Probably not. You wouldn't ask it's, them? It's an enforcement action. So it was taking place without a permit. That's all that really matters. So they now. have been, they have been doing this then, yes? Apparently. Can we agree with that? Apparently, yes. Okay. 
Had they come to the P and Z uh, Zoning Commission and asked permission to do this? No. No. Did WAG time come to us and ask permission? No. Who, what, where, when, and why does a business have the opportunity to do what the hell they want to do without getting permission from the town? What was the cease and desist order for, if I may ask? I assume for home occupation business that they didn't have a permit to do. Okay. So you guys have been operating this without permission for some time. There's been a cease and desist order issued. Have they stopped? I, I can't speak definitively, but they uh, pledged that they would stop when the cease and desist order was issued. And I May I ask when that was? I don't have it in front of me, but it was month probably or two ago. Yeah, yeah, I heard yeah, a month, maybe more than a month. I heard October, okay. I think, yeah. referenced earlier. Okay, so October, January, let's say three months. Um, I can't ask them, but my guess is they're still doing it. I don't know that. My fear is they are in violation to the cease and desist order. That's something whoever the town official is responsible for should query. Uh, and I don't want to be a jackass about this, but you know what? Um, been down this path before. Don't understand how somebody can make and take on their own, start doing something. And for you, I just want to make a comment. I have two small dogs on this side. I have one small dog on this side. And I got the smallest, biggest mouth in the world. This dog could cut steel with her voice. So there are German shepherds five times, seven, seven times their size that are more quiet than a small dog. Size of dog is irrelevant. Emotions aside, great kids, great service, great job. I love it. One gentleman said it. I can't think where he is. He made the comment, great business, wrong location. Um, what's the zoning for the Masonic Hall next door? I'm um, sure it's the same. Is it as commercial as also? VB. Village business. Okay. Here, here's my fear. There's boarding going on. It's a daycare facility. Uh, what we went through with WAG time was the same deal. It's a daycare subject to licensing with the state. Yes. They have to have state licenses to run a dog care facility. And I presented that fact last time, many times actually. You know, my fear is you know, it's just kind of loosey-goosey. They come in and do it. I admire what they do. I appreciate it. I love animals, dogs especially. I appreciate what you guys do and how they do it. But... I don't know who Rover Cap or somebody is like that. Are we doing that? It's got to be, you, it, is it a franchise? Are they operating a franchise? They're not licensed by the state, which you should buy. State licenses for dog care facilities are required. They are not. They so, are. So we're going to call you again. Huh? You, you know, I don't think that's true. This is not, I mean, that's what we've been presented with, and that's what the town has told us. They looked into it. This does not have to be licensed. Under a dog care ruling, that three, was three, bad time. Three, three so, dogs or less is what they're asking for, uh, is exempt, exempt from state licensing. Not exempt from local zoning, but exempt from state never license. Said, it never said a number in what I presented to you guys before. I, I, I can't debate it because I don't have my notes no, in front I'm, of me. You, you, you take my word for it. I've seen the statute. It's a recent statute. I think it was just approved in the last legislative session. So it was new to us as well. That you can have three dogs or less? And not be uh, required to get state licensing. Okay, they have five. It's no, the, they have five It's the dogs. three dogs for compensation. You can have as many okay. personal dogs as you'd like. Um, the house was a mess before they got in there. It's been a mess for a while. I admire their efforts to do it. But everything's on their time. Everything is, 
That's why I, I feel it's just loosey-goosey. Who's going to make sure they only have three? I know, Mr. Harley, you're not going to go down there every day and take count. The answer is Roper. So they're not here. Yeah. I'm directing my comment through so please you. Please stop. Please stop the counter dialogue. They're a he franchise. Right they're not here. Um, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. A home is not uh, a, a doggy care center, three or less two on the other side. Picket fence is useless. We know and have proven in wag time conversations that dogs get excited with activity. I feel sorry for the people next door in the Comstock Fair, as especially in those seven summer, uh, summer months where they have the different uh, weekend activities, things of this nature. It, those dogs will get excited. And what do, they, what do we do? They bark. They have the tendency to bark. They're dogs, God bless them. So this just doesn't make a lot of sense, and I'm sorry, but I, um, I can't understand how, in that location, this request makes sense. And I don't think it's fair to the town, you guys have been pushing for more businesses and things of this nature. Uh, I know they can't make a living on three dogs a day. So how do we know there's someone there all the time? Are you going to check it? If they have jobs, they go to work. There's no one home. Or they split shifts or whatever. You can't tell me that there's someone there all the time all the time. So anyways, um, lovely people, concept doesn't fit where it does, doesn't fit with the area, doesn't fit with the concept of uh, uh, neighborhood. So I would not support it, but I would ask you to consider uh, if there's any way that uh, this should not go forward. Thank you. Others? Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to, we're approaching 12 midnight, yeah. and I'd like to make a, you know, to continue this hearing to another date. Yeah, I don't think, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yep. I, I know they'd like to get it done, but. Unless, you know, there's some, well, that's, yeah, no. I put the motion forward. <clears throat> I second. Do you? And we can probably take to a vote on it. A motion to approve and conditions. Uh, yes, it's just to close the hearing. Close it out. Close the public hearing. And not to close the public hearing. Is that making a motion? Are we, are we all sure? Stop. Was a motion. All right. As to to continue this hearing at our next scheduled meeting. I I can say I I would support that. Are you going to continue um, to the next meeting? That's that the, motion? the motion. That's the motion, George. Statue, we can stop at 11. And seconded. Everybody, let's vote it out. Yeah, yeah, All those discuss it. No, I think, Mr. Chairman, we should vote on it tonight. Okay. So, so then vote, vote against, against So then vote against so, it. So, you know, is, is that what everybody's going to do? That's, that's well, we got to I'll, I'll post. I mean, what are we going to hear next time? That's what huh? I'm saying. I will withdraw my hearing. So, so, so what we haven't done, right, is we haven't even discussed potential ways to make this work, right, um, with the applicant. So, you know, so that's going to take time. And be fair to all people, all the presenters, all the fine people who have spoke for or against. I think it's in everyone's best interest to adjourn this meeting and take this up to continue the hearing at our next scheduled meeting. I do too. I'm exhausted. Because you're going to be here until 1 o'clock in the morning and oh, yes, it's not giving anyone I, on either side of this a fair shake at any of this. Motion and second, right? Yep. I second it. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. For those of you that are disappointed, I'm sorry, but we are Stop exhausted. And I'm
Thank you. Is there anything we have to do before we close? No, just a, just a couple of uh, points of information. The uh, CFPZA annual uh, dinner recognition is March 26th. Jesus. We may have somebody who uh, meets the 25 year. Joe Hammer may meet that. So um, I'll keep you posted after we look into it. But um, but I, if you're interested, uh, coordinate with me and, and let me know, and we will uh, cover the uh, we'll cover the costs on our town budget. But uh, so that's March 26th. So. Uh, take a look at your calendar and let us know. And then the only other thing to make you aware of is the uh, EDIC uh, is, uh, wants to hold a uh, workshop to discuss our self-storage regulations and the moratorium. The moratorium uh, expires in early March, so uh, we don't have at least the first 180 days of it. So we want to um, get together, discuss uh, a direction on that. So that workshop would be February 3rd, which I believe is a Monday, and I think we identified 4 p.m. as the meeting time. It's important for you to let me know if you're coming because if we meet a certain quorum, we'll have to a, we'll have to advertise it as a regular meeting. So that's great to see George is going to be there. <laughs> so I got George. Yes, he did. That's right. The fourth of February. Yes. So so let me know on that too. Third. Third. It's not the fourth. It's 4 p.m. on the third. I got it down. Well, you asked me about the fourth, and I can do that. I can't do the third. Yeah, there you go. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Anybody opposed? I think we should decide at our next meeting. Oh, just the. Oh, wait, yeah. Wait. The bank can stay. <laughs> well, we haven't had...